Well, ladies and gentlemen, Dissatisfied Philosophy, Mr. Hunter Coates, has given the world a book that I think is really, really needed that brings together the thinking of Lacan and the topic of conspiracies. I just had a wonderful conversation with uh, Raymond K. Hessel and Samuel Barnes on the topic. I've had a few talks uh, with Lorenzo, a good friend of mine, on it. And I think that by not thinking about conspiracies, we're really missing out on, you could argue, one of the most um, consequential and prevalent forms of thought that are defining the world as of 2023 and the last, oh, I don't know, 10 years, really. Uh, and there really has not, in my opinion, been um, enough of an analysis using the right schema or framework to understand what a conspiracy is. Very often we've just gone, oh, conspiracies are what crazy people do, which then means we don't have to think about it, right? Because that's what the crazy people do. But what if there's something more profound going on, something more, dare I say, risky, something more that we need to look at? And maybe we don't want to look at it because if we look at it closely, we might see a little bit of our own reflection in it. And uh, not like to see how we might be a little more uh, aligned or closer to conspiratorial thinking naturally than we think. Uh, but in order to bring that out, I think uh, we need to get into Lacan. And Mr. Mr. Hunter Coates has done just that. And I really, really suggest his book, which I enjoyed, Conspiracy in the Subject. I'm noticing it's mirrored in the Zoom, uh, Zoom camera. But, you know, that would make you want to go to Amazon to read the title even more clearly from left to right. There you go. But it's a wonderful book. And Mr. Hunter Coates, thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I'm excited to get into Lacan and discuss conspiracies and maybe some Hegel, some Kant. We'll see. Bam, all the good ones, all the good ones. Well, Mr. Yeah. Hunter Coates, if I were to ask you what made you write the book, what are you trying to do in the mm -hmm. book, what are some of the main ideas, how would you respond to that, sir? Yeah, so I think I wrote the book. Um, I was I was first... The first inspiration was I was listening to an interview with Elenka Zupancic, who's one of my many inspirations. She's a she's a Libjahanian, Lacanian, um, kind of a tongue twister, <laughs> Libjahanian, Lacanian. But um, yeah, so I, I was listening to an interview with her about conspiracies, um, and I got ten minutes in, and I was like, I need to write on this, and so I just started writing something, and I never finished. I never ended up finishing her interview. <laughs> Uh, that I was watching, but um, I got about two pages in, and eventually I was like, I've come this far, never written 30 pages, 20 pages, whatever, um, for an essay, and I was like, let's turn it into a book. So it started as an essay, became a book, and from there, I just kind of expanded. I went back and was like, all right, we have to get more into just conspiracy, we have to get into the the practicality of what conspiracy means for society, sort of talk about how we can try and overcome conspiracy if we can, and get more into just beyond what I the basic analysis that I had, which is still the first part of the book, but everything else that came after was expanding on that, you said. Well, on that first half of the book, well, first off, some of the um, best ideas are precisely those that you have to pursue so quickly that you never get back mm -hmm. to the thing that inspired it. I've had a few uh, reading books and get to like page 50. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Underline, go and start writing. And then three years later, you're like, wait, I never fit, finished that Bergson book. Oh, funny. Uh, and I think, you know, Cadell and uh, Theory Undergrad, they've been doing some of the Zupancho, What is mm -hmm. Sex? And she's such a tremendous thinker. And I, I certainly mm -hmm. hope that her reputation continues to spread and her works are more widely read. Um, you mentioned the first part of the book. What when you, what are some of the analysis you like to bring out in that on conspiracies and the topic uh, that you brought up? Yeah. So one of the first things I try and do in the introduction is kind of lay out some basic terms. Um, something that I have a big pet peeve with is Lacanians who don't explain the terms they're using. And I get really upset because I think even Zizek falls into this quite a bit more so now than his early work but I, I read his book sometimes and i'm like if i've never read lacan i mean i have no idea what you're saying you're just saying the word symbolic you're using the word real what does this mean so the entire first chapter is kind of like an introduction to lacan and i wrote it in the way of like someone who has barely touched philosophy maybe they've read some plato so they're like acclimated to academic language but they've never engaged in psychoanalysis they can understand the first chapter and if that's all they can understand then that's a worthwhile book so i put all of the kind of big ideas in the first chapter and then build out what they mean um and i think and i think doing this allows people that you know maybe they're new to lacan they don't want to read the whole book they can at least get a good good glimpse of what I'm going to talk about. And maybe once they read more, they can come back or whatever. But um, 
one of the main ideas that I try and set out first is the big other and what it means for a big other to be non-lacking. So in Lacan's verbiage, a big other is sort of this symbolic authority that directs our desire and this can be anything from like a moral law to like a cultural norm using manners at the table or something like more specifically like a like a government like an actual physical um legal law you can say and the big other is kind of of all, all of these into one term and um a non-lacking big other is that all these various laws are complete, that there's this completion that can be found through language. And Lacan is very against the notion that language is complete. He always says that language is ambivalent, it's ambiguous, um, and there's always this like real that is underlying language. And this real underlying language is important because it's the same kind of gap between words not fully meaning what we're trying to get to and the moral law not fully intending what it's trying to right someone may say put your napkin in your lap at the table right but what does this really mean what if, if what would happen if you were to start grabbing napkins from the table and putting them all in your lap and then you had 10 napkins in your lap this someone would look at you like you're crazy right this is that sort of gap between the moral law or the cultural law telling us to do something and and what it actually is trying to say um so someone who believes in a non-lacking big other would be unable to differentiate between the gaps in this big other and sort of the belief that the big other is all consuming and that these desires that it's articulating putting your napkin in your lap is fully comprehensible and this for lacan is the position of the psychotic no, that's a that's a wonderful, and I, um, you know, there's a few things that I think can happen with um, intellectuals or academics. You, um, it's the curse of knowledge, as Mr. Pinko once put it, where you know what a term means, so you forget that other people don't know what the term means. This happens all the time, uh, and it, it's really difficult to remember that. Oh wait, the person I'm speaking to has not necessarily absorb those terms or think of them some same way and it, it almost can feel i can understand for the writer or the thinker it can almost feel laborious or way i have to go through it again and again and again but yeah when you're you know when you're presenting a work or a book you could easily lose them that's just kind of kind of part of it uh, it's just like every time you start a, key, a car you always have to turn the key you always have to fill it with gas there's some pre-steps you have to do mm -hmm. that if you don't you're probably not going to go anywhere and you could go oh great turn the key again well yes <laughs> it's not going to move if you don't so it goes with defining terms and different things i think you did a very nice job at the beginning of the book defining those terms which again if the reader doesn't have they're not gonna be able to follow the argument so i thought that was really good i also really liked um when you were describing the napic example because it goes to show you where when it, when i say put a napkin in your lap and you put it in your lap there's an entire context about the sentence that you've absorbed and internalized that i don't even have to explain to you right uh which almost goes to show you that the power of the society has been more absorbed. So maybe you rebel against, no, I'm not gonna put the napkin in my lap. But the very fact that you heard that the command was intelligible does mean you are operating having absorbed that context already. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. already some degree the other has um, occupied you in a way. Yes. And then, then you're always at risk of the supposed rebellion still being a rebellion in that framework and therefore you're still operating um, within the power structure. Mm -hmm. uh, the great example I think is always Kafka where even when Joseph K is rebelling against mm -hmm. the bureaucracy, he's still in the bureaucracy according to its terms that he's yes. going against. Or I was going to say um, Louis Althusser's term and interpolation. The classic example is a cop says, Hey you, and you turn around not because you know they're talking to you, but because you hear this power that you know is a power that has power over you, and it's saying, hey, you, and because it's sort of directed in your in, in your line of sight or whatever, you just kind of assume it's talking to you. And even if you're not guilty, you feel the sense of guilt because this is what the power has been instructed to do. It's been made for subjects to feel a sense of guilt when they shout, hey, you. That's a really good association. And even if the moment you turn your head, even if all you do is turn your head, that's a gesture, a gesture. I can never say that. A gesture. I want to say gesture because it's kind of funny, but it's also horrifying. Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe it is Kafka-esque, right? Uh, you know, the gesture, yeah. that alone suggests that you are participating in. And that too, what's interesting to think, if we think of power that way in terms of the big other, and I know you make the distinctions in, in Lacan as well between the lowercase o other and the capital O other and all of these different distinctions. Another point many Lacanians don't. 
don't do. I, I I was very clear. I was trying to say, okay, so here's an example. I believe I used an example where like you get up and you're like putting on clothes or whatever. And the big other is this sort of like externality of the gaze of like society itself that is looking at you and judging you and telling you to desire things and stuff like that. And then the other, the, the small other is just the people that you meet and the way they look at you. And it's this individual gaze, you can say, and this individual re relation with other people, but it's not this complete societal gaze. And I try and draw that distinction because I think a lot of times, even in Lacan's work, he would kind of at times equate the two. I think it's important to not equate the two because they have two different inclinations for both clinical and theoretical work. No, I think it's a very good point. I mean, going back to the napkin example, the person across the table is the lowercase o other. And when they tell mm -hmm. you to put the napkin in your lap, that's participating in the capital O other. Uh, but there is mm -hmm. something where the lowercase O other is acting on behalf of the uppercase O other. But the moment you put it in your lap, mm -hmm. you're also doing the same thing. And so there's this interesting thing where the lowercase O other is participating and pointing to the capital O other, but it's also not reducible to it. But then, of course, the trick is the moment mm -hmm. you put the napkin in your lap, you too are actually pointing to the capital O other. So that's a reason why you don't want to reduce the capital O other to the lowercase, because as long as you're participating in the system of, of gestures, then there can be an issue. And as we know in Lacan, it's not the there's it's not inherently bad that you have this system of shared intelligibility, because if you don't, then you might confront the real and have a negative response that you're not ready for. And this gets into all the tragic vision that we have to get into. You know, if you want to take down the capital mm -hmm. O other, well, you might be um, you might have to confront all the things that that's uh, keeping you from facing. Right. Uh, and that mm -hmm. can prove quite, yes. quite difficult uh, to undergo. How? I, would, I would say that. Oh, sorry. I was going to say that I think this is a good response to someone like Deleuze, where Deleuze is trying to confront the capital O other right there, anti-Oedipus confront the Oedipal complex, confront the primal father. And I think that he kind of skirts all this sort of this, this tragedy and this sort of the real that you would be confronting if you were to confront the other head on, which is why I don't think that he confronts the other as much as he thinks he does. He kind of, he kind of says he does, and then he kind of just falls back into the other, right? He still capitulates to the other, even in a sense, you can say that his, that his protest against the other is a part of what the other is desiring for him to do. Um, and this is a point that someone like, weirdly, someone like Nick Land uh, makes in reference to modern leftism. He thinks that like modern leftism has sort of brought the notion of protest into a capitulation to commodification. When you see things like M M Maoist M um, mugs and Marx posters and Marx t-shirts, right? You've you've brought this part of protest, this confronting the big other into the process of capitulating to the big other um so well i i think the the big conversation or the big debate if you will seems to have something to do with deleuze and hegel and lacan and all these different people uh and i um I did. I have gone down quite a long Deleuzian rabbit hole, reading Difference and Repetition, his cinema books, and all these different things. And um, although I would be happy to be corrected by a Deleuzian scholar who knows more than me, I do find it difficult to deny Zupancha's assessment, which Chiton brought up in the his essay that was featured in Abyssal Arrows, the uh, Nietzsche anthology we put out with everyone, which was a lot of fun. And Zupancha says that in Deleuze, there is realization, but not the confrontation of the real. And so what mm -hmm. ends up happening is the realization, you know, you're real. it's a realized ontology uh, in metaphysics and so on versus a real ontology. And so as a result, what you end up doing is you get a multiplicity of ontologies that are actually still operating under the other. And because you're not confronting the real, you really now, of course, confronting the real entails a kind of realization, but it's but it has to come from that confrontation of the real, not skirting around the real by saying basically there is no real. There's just the realized ontology that is its own grounding. Now, again, there's something quite beautiful, if you grant that term, about this uh, Deleuzean metaphysics and ontology, but it does run the risk of not confronting the real and therefore actually being in service 
of perhaps the very real it wants to confront. So if we were to put this in economic terms, I think Deleuzeism, and I think Zizek makes this point as well, Deleuze is great for capitalism. I mean, this whole idea mm -hmm. of, an, of, yes. of realizing in an in, individual ontology and metaphysics, and then you're kind of cut off from shared intelligibility to maybe have communal activity that could stand against the capitalist system. When people are atomized, they tend to become more capitalistic, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then if there's a notion of kind of expression, well, we can market to that. And uh, mm -hmm. while simultaneously, because as you know, in Deleuze, there's the distinction between, you know, you want to be imperceptible. And I think mm -hmm. Justin Murphy is quite good when he says Deleuze wants you to be imperceptible, but that doesn't mean to be obscure. But here's the problem. Who decides the difference between imperceptible and obscure? And when I think I'm mm -hmm. not obscure, I think I'm just imperceptible. The neighbors around me who I need to have community with to maybe have some sort of power to stand against the capital O other, uh, then they can't understand me. Uh, and, and that actually then could cause resentment because, hey, I'm what are you acting like? I'm obscure. I'm only imperceptible. And then you start having some mm -hmm. problems that kind of fall apart. And so the question is, it's an interesting question because it gets into what does communal and political formation look like when it's a shared confronting of the real mm -hmm. as opposed to a realization that's kind of denying the real, even as it thinks it's dealing with the real. Um, and that, I think, is a lot of the political challenge today that we have to think for, think mm -hmm. of. And maybe it's interesting to think that there's kind of a way in which I'd have to think about this. There's something Deleuzean about the conspiracy itself, uh, that its own kind of shared multiplicity by which to understand the world. It's not this kind of individual multiplicity, but we all have kind of our different tribes by which we then formulate a matter to have a shared purpose in the desire of realizing this conspiracy that, of course, we don't actually want to complete because then we'd lose the source of our desire. So exactly, I'd have to exactly. think about that. But there's something interesting, perhaps, too, about thinking Deleuze and conspiracy as the conspiracy being what you fall into when you have Deleuzean thought. And, and then, of course, the only way to understand how that's actually in service of denying the real in its own realization is through a Lacanian analysis as you bring to the table. But no, I really think and then I'll give it back to you that Zupancha's distinction between realization and the real is interesting. And but then, of course, like if you're going to confront the real, you have to um, be ready to confront the real and to come to terms with the ways that the subject operates and how we don't really want what we want. We want to pretend like we want what we want, but not actually get it because then it would unveil that it's not what we think. So we engage in these complicated mental psychological gymnastics, uh, like Lacan describes, uh, mm -hmm. and that these are all ways of running from the real. And then, of course, the problem is a Deleuzean structure may allow us to call all of those gymnastics ontological and metaphysical. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then it's not a way of avoiding the real. It's, an un it's a realization of deepest reality. So there could be a danger in Deleuze actually... Um, turning a lot of the things that Lacan warns about into some sort of um, realization of metaphysical truth. So I like what Zupancha says. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that that's interesting. I don't know a ton about Deleuze. I've read Anti-Oedipus and I've read Difference Repetition. I haven't read a cinema books. I haven't read Bounds of Sense or whatever it's called. I think it, Logic of Sense. Mm -hmm. I haven't read that either. But um, what, 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 what I've, I talk about Deleuze a little bit in my book. And one of the things that I talk about is how the the notion of micropolitics, I think Zizek gets to this too, is that micropolitics is kind of capitalism. It's it's this belief that the individual has all this power and that the individual can engage in a engage in their own uh life against against other people. That the individual is an island, you can say. And that's kind of the Deleuzean look on, on individualism that I think. And I think individualism is incorrect on ontological and a practical. Um but so, yeah, I think Deleuze definitely plays into sort of the movement of capital. Uh, you can also talk on his notion of deterritorialization, the the deterritorialization that occurs of um, when when we're when we feel that that our desire is disconnected from the big other. We continuously try and push ourselves away and away and away, and this deterritorialization can even lead to maybe becoming conspiratorial subjects um this this feeling that we're so disconnected and we're disconnecting ourselves from the big other disconnecting ourselves from this this uh matrix of um desires um and capital could lead us to become conspiratorial subjects and enter a word that i use is the world of the ego this this world of the ego this like this boundary that we set up against other people and this boundary that we set up against realizing a communitarian or a 
or a political position which emphasizes community. And I think that this is what I talk about this in, I believe, chapter chapter two, the, where the world of ego is, is at once a boundary against coming to our own desire. It's a boundary against the external world. And it's a boundary against the other, right? Mm. It's sort of a three-tiered boundary that the world of the ego, the, the world, the, the world of ego sets up. And conspiratorial subjects fall into the world of ego as an attempt to erode themselves from what they see as deception. This deception of the big other, um, which by definition of deception that I lay out in the beginning, can kind of be summarized as this illusory attempt by the subject to save the big other from incompleteness. Mm. And in doing so, they view the big other as all deceiving. But in viewing the big other as all deceiving, they raise deception to the status of a big other. And then deception as an idea dictates their desire and dictates how they view other people and how they view their place in society. And um, yeah. No, I think that connection, that's very good. Um, so if you, I love the part where you capitalize the D and refer to deception as the mm -hmm. big other, which then of course, if you're deceived, that confirms the big other, right? And so yes. <laughs> like, and if you don't, and if you never find the big other or face the big other, then that just proves the big other. So it becomes, you know, and if all of that are the gymnastics in which desire uh, and enjoyment come about, because what we want with enjoyment is actually not to reach our object. And by making the big other itself the object, when we don't um, reach it or we don't find it or we don't face it, that only confirms it. So then we lock ourselves yes. in perfectly in this cycle of enjoyment that we've always wanted. Uh, so it's a kind of horrific mm -hmm. masterpiece, uh, if you will. And I was thinking of Macbeth there. I really, it, so it's very interesting, this connection between Deleuze here, because I think you're exactly right. There's this kind of deterritorialization that then it's kind of like, if I think of a conspiracy as a deterritorialized space, um, mm -hmm. then there's something about it. Nomadic that really, space, you can say. Yeah. Sure. Nomadic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. There's something very like creative about it. There's something very sort of expressive mm -hmm. about it. There's something very, in that sense, Deleuzean about it. And there, and everyone has their own secret groups because when it's kind of funny because when you form a conspiracy, a group or that has a conspiracy, then you have the truth and you're trying to look into it. But there's also the people running the conspiracy have the truth, right? And no one outside of them has it as well, right? So it's funny how there's mm -hmm. kind of an isomorphic in that where the you know they have the truth and only they have it and you got to get to them where if you're in the conspiracy you have the truth i mean the you have the truth that you're that you know the big other has and you're trying to get to the big other quote unquote yes you don't actually want to do it so there's something interesting in isomorphic so there's kind of relation there you kind of feel mm -hmm. like you're not atomized because you're trying to get to the bottom of things go beyond yourself and relate to other mm -hmm. people that are atomized but you actually are atomized and that i think is part of what happens in Deleuze is it gives you this feeling of, oh no, we're all, we're all imperceptible. We're all in relation as Deleuzeans. But actually when that would, to have a real relation, it would require confronting the real. You're just kind of mm -hmm. asserting a relation by us all having this shared imperceptibility uh, in different things. And it's interesting to think that almost what ends up happening in the con, in the conspiracy, it has this Deleuzean flavor to it that kind of knows it needs to acknowledge something like an other, something like a reality out there, but then doesn't want to go into Lacan because then that would perhaps reflect back on what it's actually doing. So it's almost like a Delusian Lacanianism in a way. It kind of has the like, hmm. it has the forms of Lacan. It has the kind of ideas of Lacan, but not structured in a manner that could make the conspiracy realize what it's doing which maybe contributes to it being even more problematic because then as a counterfeit of Lacan, in a, if you will, in a, in a delusion structure, mm -hmm. it's then even more defended from a critique that would make it realize what it is doing mm -hmm. and, because it's using the forms, uh, if you will, or the ideas of Lacan. But since it's okay. actually in service of a delusion micropolitics in this kind of nomadic way, it never confronts the real, but since it's kind of using the mm -hmm. notions of Lacan uh, without the structure, which of course without the structure, it doesn't matter, uh, then it's more easy to um, feel like you you don't need this critique, uh, the Lacanian critique, because you feel mm -hmm. like you're actually implementing it and aware of it. So it's almost like a weird mm -hmm. Deleuzean Lacanianism. I don't even know how to <laughs> say that, 
Uh, and that might also speak to some of the dangers of Deleuze in, in that it lets you take the ideas of Lacan and put them in service of Deleuze without them being convicted by Lacan, if you will, to go, wait a minute, am I actually doing what Lacan's warning about, but I'm structuring it in a manner that makes me avoid that conviction? So I'm really interested in the way you talked about Deleuze there. Yeah, so one of the main um one of the main conspiracies that I that I kind of center on is sort of conspiracies surround um that, that kind of has a, kind of have as their basis like a like a very like anti-semitic core. Cuz I think a mm. lot of conspiracies, especially nowadays and even they have this anti-semitic core where they hold the the Jewish person as like this object of both like retaliation and desire. Um and it's it it it's in the sense of like a banking uh, sense of conspiracy which which says that like oh there's there's this there's this cabal of jewish people and they run banks there's this the, the people who believe this they at once want to both be the people that run the banks but they also want to maintain a distance it's, it's this paradox yeah. because they, they don't want to be totally subsumed in the big other right but they also want want they the the jealousy the desire for being in that position is there as well um and i think that that's kind of a common attribute that i found in a lot of anti-semitic conspiracy theories um is that there's there's a there's clearly a paradox where the people that believe this they they both want to be in the position of where they believe the jewish person is but they also want to maintain a gap because they don't want to yeah. because they also want to maintain a gap at the same time because they don't want to be the other and it's it's this option that, that that I find a lot. And one of the main case studies I look at is Kanye West in chapter three. I talk about Kristen and how Kanye West will, will will go from seemingly questioning the 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 big other, you can say, in in in, in uh, Zupanchus's terms, he's he's not recognizing the real. He's gauging in a realization. He's pushing the big other, but only to then put the big other back in back in place. Mm. Puts it back in place, and so this is all like this is all made up. I'm I'm being deceived and all that. And then he goes, "Well, I know who's deceiving me. It's the caricature of you, right?" So he puts right. this this caricature back in place, and that and this character can then be whom he puts his puts his feelings of malice, his feelings of anger, but also his feelings of desire towards. Mm. So it's this it's this dual purpose that, that the caricature of the Jews and the West and that anti-Semitic conspiracy theories kind of function in this way. No, I think the point in your book and this very mm -hmm. key dynamic of maintaining a gap with the thing you claim you want. And it's like, like you say with the bank, like everyone's like, oh, the rich, oh, the, the Jews running the banks and different things. There's simultaneously the desire to have that power and to be that power, but to simultaneously speak in a manner that maintains a gap between you and the power structure. And how do you live in such a manner mm -hmm. that hides the fact that you want that uh, that there's this kind of focus and envy while also positioning yourself as kind of superior in, to it in recognizing it, right? So how do you, um, like, how do you entertain your desire for something while simultaneously maintaining your status and seeing that, seeing those people who fulfill that desire as problematic? So this maintaining a gap yeah, between yeah. you and the object is these really complicated um, mm -hmm. dynamics. And I and I can't help just, there's almost a way too where we can almost do that with Lacan's thinking as well, right? Where like Lacan's thinking itself mm -hmm. is a certain object that we're like, yes, we're Lacan, yes, we're facing the real. Mm -hmm. but, but we just talk about Lacan. You can almost say the difference between talking Lacan and living Lacan. Uh, mm -hmm. And that in of itself, it's funny to think like, we don't want to actually face ourselves as a Lacanian subject. We just want to talk about Lacanian subjects which is not what we do, by the way, because we have the enlightenment of having read Lacan and no, we don't do that. When in fact, <laughs> uh, you know, we're actually putting that in service of um, our, our very way of maintaining desire so that we don't have to confront the real. And the funny thing I get is to think that is there a way in which the conspiracy is a delusian expression that talks about Lacanian subjects like the other, like the power, like, you know, how there's the media is keeping you back from seeing the truth, there's a the gap between it's all these kind of the, all these kind of ideas that have a Lacanian flavor to them, but you're just talking about it, right? You're not actually taking it seriously because if you took it seriously that human beings could do this, what if you were doing this to yourself, right? 
Because what does a conspiracy mm-hmm. do other than like control the information flow, control the media, control the people who people meet? Like it, it creates a tunnel in which information is siloed in service of the conspiracy that's claiming that that's say, for example, it was, is what the government is doing or the cabal is doing or the banks are doing, right? Uh-huh. You're doing the very mm-hmm. thing in the conspiracy that you're saying that other people are doing, which if you were to mm-hmm. actually not just talk Lacan per se, or talk the things of Lacan, but actually to internalize them, well, then you might not make that mistake. But that's almost the difference of realizing realizing Lacan versus the real of Lacan, right? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, like, to me, the reason why the analysis of the conspiracy is so critical, and then I'll give it back to you, um, is that the conspiracy seems to almost be like this real, this like masterpiece of mental gymnastics mm-hmm. to where you can participate in the very things that, that are problematic, that make you then feel like you're convicted by those things, but actually they're in service of you avoiding the conviction. So again, mm-hmm. you deal, you talk about Lacan so that you don't have to analyze, uh, analyze yourself in light of Lacan, because it feels like mm-hmm. if you talk about it, you're doing it. And it's funny that the conspiracy in talking about the deep state then doesn't reflect on itself having a deep state structure. Now, of course, there are different, yes. uh, you know, there are different kinds of conspiracies. I also think I was mentioning to Barnes, and I'll give it back to you and Raymond. Sometimes I think we do have the word conspiracy to do too much. People will talk about Bigfoot as a conspiracy. They'll talk about aliens yeah. as a conspiracy. And then it's kind of like those don't quite seem the same in some respects. Yeah. Uh, cause then you're just saying like, I guess the government knows about Bigfoot and they're holding it back or something. I don't know. Uh, so it seems like mm-hmm. that, that term might overreach, but if we're talking more about say these governmental conspiracy or different things, it's just very interesting how, um, the very, cons- like something like QAnon actually has a structure in its very operation that's similar to what it's judging. Uh, which then should all, if you take all that seriously, as your book helps us do, then we should also as readers go, huh? Am I reading Lacan without convicting myself under Lacan? Like, what am I avoiding in that? And I think that's an important uh, step to make. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, speaking of QAnon, I was actually about to go into that a little bit. Is that nice. I think QAnon is a great example, kind of as like this, this, um, this, this ultimate conspiracy. Because what is Q? Q is this just sort of like signifier, where there's no face. There's 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 no like image. It's just a signifier, this empty signifier that is just applied to things. Oh, Q told us this. Q told us that. Q knows this is going to happen. And it's this all income signifier, which is why it's so powerful for conspiracy, because it can be thrown at anything. And the the, the relation between Trump and QAnon is very interesting because because for, for QAnon supporters, Trump never really talked about QAnon. He never supported QAnon. But for Trump supporters, everything Trump did, or even in a paradoxical sense, everything Trump didn't do proved QAnon. Everything Trump did or didn't do proved QAnon. If Trump didn't talk about QAnon, it's because Q said, don't talk about me. I, I've got it under control. You're the face of my movement, but I've but I've got it under control. If Trump ever did talk about QAnon, it's because Q was like, okay, Put put my name out there. Get my name out there. Put some put some flack on me. And even if Trump was to denounce QAnon, it would be even more of a deception because the, the conspiratorial subjects would go, "Oh, this is all planned. Trump has denounced QAnon because he's trying to distance himself from the truth because he knows the truth. But because he wants to continue being elected by the deep state, he has to continue putting up this this front as if he doesn't know the truth. So in these two ways." you're still confronted with the point that Q exists and there's no getting out of this. And this is why I think Q is this sort of beautiful like articulation of, of jouissance because the jouissance people feel of our, of signifying knowledge or desires as from Q is a way to avoid, at least in the COVID pandemic, their own current situations, right? People lost jobs, people lost family members and QAnon gained a lot of popularity in the period of 2020. It first came on the scene in 2017 after Trump's election, but it but it gained a lot of popularity in 2020. And I would say this is because people are trying to direct their libidinal energy into something which is not really which doesn't really have impact on their actual life. So they can forget about their actual life and forget about the job they lost. They can forget the family members lost to COVID and instead point their focus 
distance on something which has, but at the same time, it feels like it is so close. The the proximity of it is at once very far away in the sense that it doesn't actually exist and that there's no like thing called Q, but at the same time, it feels so close because everything plays into Q told us this, Q told us that, Q proved that right. I, I think that's a very, very important point. I also really appreciate, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that QAnon is from 2017. I think most people think it started in like 2020, but really the fact, like once you understand that, then you can definitely see why Lacan is so important here because you have people trapped in their homes. They can't get, they don't know what to do. They don't know what to think. Like, can you go outside? Will you get sick? Will you not? There's also, I think the desperate need for libidinal energy to be directed towards something skyrockets in an environment of ambiguity. Like if you knew like, oh, I could, you know, go do something and it would be okay. Well, then you know where to put your libidinal energy. So you're looking for something that feels more solid, which then ironic is that QAnon is arguably the most unsolid thing in the world, but precisely because of its structure, you can make it solid and therefore be a reliable um, way to direct libidinal, libidinal energy, which in an environment like COVID is desperately needed because you don't even know if you can go to the bowling alley without dying or something, right? Like it's all ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And also the key, I actually think that if you knew 100% that if you went to the bowling alley, you would get sick and die, that almost makes it easier to live with it. Uh, because then you like know mm -hmm. what you're not doing and you actually then know that staying at home, for example, is mm -hmm. noble. But then what ends up happening is people like, is it noble? Is it silly? Is it not? And that like all the different media sources giving you different yes. stories then made it unclear what you should do and not. And in that situation of ambiguity, libidinal mm -hmm. energy, I think, is really hungry for something. Uh, and then it really, yeah. you know, latches on to QAnon. Um, and also every time I hear about Q, um, I can't help but think about Street Fighter 3 with the character Q in a mask in a, in a cave that we never saw his face. So I am wondering if QAnon's Q... Is I wish I knew about that. I would have tied that in. I did not know about that. But that's a great example. <laughs> e that, that is real. I didn't know about that. I would have definitely tied that in. Where, oh my gosh. where the mask of Q... And, yeah, this is this this is, has me thinking now just on a spiral. The, the, the mask of Q is kind of the same way, at least in the story of Exodus, how the mask of God works. I use a, a, the story of Moses from Exodus I use where where God says, if, if you lie, right? And Moses turns away or God turns away. I believe God turns away. And in, in understanding this this story, I, I, I kind of see this turning away as God masking himself. He's masking himself from those is masking himself. When God says that you cannot look at me or you will die, I take that as Moses, if he looks at God, if he looks at the real, he will he will lose his 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 subjectivity. He will lose his big other, who he has so much love for, who he has so much um fidelity to, to their desires, right? That's why Moses doesn't look at the real. The same way that the Street Fighter character, if we were to see what was behind the mask, maybe this would this would this would lose the mystery maybe people only played this character because they didn't know what was behind the mask every other character you saw their face you saw their face and and this character you couldn't see their face and perhaps that is where the the desire for playing this character can come from and one more thing talking about the face is very interesting because zizek has done a lot of work on the face um uh zizek's common talk of hegel's quote um the skull, uh, spirit is a bone. There's that common quote from Hegel, spirit is a bone. And what Zizek reads it as is the sense that behind the face is this traumatic reel, the skull, mm -hmm. right? Behind the face, which we associate with our neighbor, is the skull. And this is why, as Lacan says, there's this there's this inner aggressive aggressivity that Freud identifies in civilization and discontents when he's talking about the neighbor. When Freud says you cannot love the neighbor, like like as a, as a universal commandment, he's saying this because there's this there's this break in what we identify as our neighbor. Because what we identify as our neighbor is simply the phenomenal perception, but behind this is the skull. That's all the neighbor really is. It's just the skull, right? And so we try and hide ourselves from this notion that the, that the neighbor is a skull by identifying with the neighbor. Um, yeah. No, I really like the thought experiment of the idea that if you saw your neighbor as a skeleton, it wouldn't be your neighbor. Uh, they'd be yeah. someone entirely different. And so when we say love your neighbor, 
we almost already without even realizing it, and the same as the napkin example, you're operating in a context without knowing it. When you say love your neighbor, you're operating in a context of assuming a certain um, hierarchy with the phenomenological, the phenomenal experience of them, the face with the skin on it is what you mean by neighbor, not the, not the skeleton, right? Uh, which is so mm -hmm. obvious yes. when you say it, but then it's not obvious until you say it, right? You know, until that mm -hmm. moment, then it comes forth. And no, I think it gets into like, it's, it's real easy to talk about the conviction of the other in the face, like a Levinas or something like that. And the fine and the end. This is things. Zizek's response to Levinas, where yep. Levinas says that, that, that we, we identify evil. We identify our neighbor as not evil because the neighbor has a face. We identify with their face. But Zizek's point is, well, the neighbor isn't just the face, it's the skull. And okay. this is that traumatic, real underlying ethics uh, for Zizek. Well, yeah, and I think that's the critical idea of like all these people talking about building community or new organizations or political missions or different things like that. One of the, in a way, one of the things that the big other knows that people don't know is precisely that you're in love with the face, not the skull. And the big other just sits back mm -hmm. and says, it's only a matter of time before the skull comes out, before the real of the mm -hmm. other comes and your effort to stop me gets destroyed, per se. Now, of course, there is no big other in a way, but then if we're just talking about governmental structure, like if, if yeah. like there's a real sense in which the government knows that in order for the people to have some sort of chance against it, the people would have to get along and the government just giggles. They're like, oh yeah, wait till the real comes out. Wait till you find out that it's real yeah. easy. You know, it's real easy to talk about delusion realization and creative expression and imperceptibility as a group. And then y'all have to argue about who's cleaning the bathroom. Then you have to argue about yep. money. And then everything mm -hmm. turns out that realization was actually an ideological way to avoid the real. Oh crap. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, a way to like, it's, it's really nice to talk the way I kind of describe the losing metaphysics is as an essential difference where like difference is, is essence as opposed to being at the end of the day. And that's all well and good. If you don't have to convince someone to fix the pipes of your house, or if you don't have to convince <laughs> someone, uh, that you need help fixing the garage, right? You can be as imperceptible mm -hmm. as you want. And it, it gets into why I actually think it's an entirely different topic that looking at Japan can help us think where delusionism leads. And I love the Japan art and music world and different things. So that's not a hit on Japan. We have to figure out how to think to lose with the real as opposed to a spurious infinity of realization that doesn't lead to a true infinity of relating with the other, which must entail the reality of the skull uh, as opposed to denying mm -hmm. that skull. Uh, I think these are starting mm -hmm. to point at the terms of the political today. Um, which if we don't face, I think we just end up with conspiracies. I mean, what else do people do? Uh, like if you don't, like, it's almost like there's something also about the conspiracy that I think talks, ties to the COVID point. Oh, and before I forget, yeah, man, the Q, it's all about the mask of the Street Fighter 3 character, um, which was the greatest yeah. fighting game of all time uh, for all of us fighting game geeks out there uh, from the days of the Super Nintendo. Uh, no, that was on PlayStation. Uh, but anyway, uh, 1994 or something. No, a little later. Anyway... People started to see Q on like the ship and Street Fighter 2 in the background. It's like, oh, he was there the whole time. They could see the character throughout yeah. the Street Fighter Oh, this series. is so great. I wish I knew this stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did. Oh, it's this great. It's really great. Yeah. I actually am convinced yeah. that Q is that from Q and I'm like, if we ever find yeah, exactly. it, just, all these people like me played as him as like a 12 year old. And as they get older, mm -hmm. they're like, it's Q. He's doing it. He's behind yep. it all. That guy with the mask and the, yep. the freaking trench coat. So uh, is that him? That's <laughs> him. Uh, so uh, so no. And and so there's also something about in COVID leading people to hungry for QAnon. There's a kind of empowerment in that. There's like, oh, I need some kind of like power, which is always tied to libidinal power and desire and different things. Well, likewise, conspiracy becomes a kind of empowerment because we know that, ha, government, you tried to keep the truth from us. Well, we know it, and we're coming for you. Mm -hmm. They maintain the gap forever, but it's great to talk about coming for you because there's a power in that. And there is something mm -hmm. as well, I think, with Deleuze, where when you can make everything about the essential difference, like you in being an individual, where in Hegel, there seems to be a movement from the universal, the individual, you have to earn the singularity, basically, the singular, yes. as they talk about. And Deleuze, it's almost like by default, you're a kind of singular and having an essential difference and that sort of metaphysics. There's an empowerment in that because I become kind mm -hmm. of the center 
of uh, and just being me and figuring out an imperceptible way to be to um, to be a manifestation of a very, very deep metaphysic, uh, which then would almost speak to I wonder. And again, everything I'm saying on Deleuze, I am more than happy to be corrected on by someone who knows Deleuze mm -hmm. far better than I. Um, so I'm not trying to put down the gauntlet on Deleuze. But I do wonder if there's something about Deleuze that is a response to the trauma of Lacan and the big other. Like there's mm. kind of the trauma of the big other that then Deleuze gives you a way to deal with it uh, by basically saying, nah, big other, I don't need to confront the real. I'll just realize, take that. Uh, so <laughs> there's kind of like, it's almost like there's something about Deleuze and the conspiracy as well that is a certain kind of traumatic response to the big other or to the, to the other capital O mm -hmm. that then's like, okay, well, I tell you what, we're going to use all of the forms and ideas of the big other to make our own organization. Ha! You know, we can't overthrow the state, but we ourselves can have an isomorphic structure like the deep state in the conspiracy. So we're just as powerful as you are. So there's this interesting, and then I'll give it to you, it's interesting to think of maybe some of the mistakes of this realization ism i guess i'll add ism to him you can't you know just throw that on uh mm -hmm. is precisely yeah. responding to a kind of trauma uh it, it, because then covid's a kind of trauma that people respond to with QAnon. <laughs> yeah I, I think that's interesting one thing i wanted to go back to was your discussion of ambiguity um and sort of how the ambiguity of the big other is sort of i would i would agree with todd mcgowan who he was debating um you know i don't know his last name doug he's from sublation media and one of the things that he and Doug disagreed on was that Todd McGowan was very clear that laws should try and be the least ambiguous possible. He gave the example of a speeding of a speed limit, right? When we see speed limits, we know that those aren't really the limit of how fast you can go. Everyone drives about three to five miles over the speed limit, if yeah. they're 10, right? And so Todd says that this creates a great deal of ambiguity and anxiety where if there was an actual speeding limit, right? If the speeding limit was 58, even because it's, it says 55, but they came back and said it's actually 58, this would be far more en um, enjoyable for the subjects, right? Because they know there's an actual limit. They know that, that something will happen when they get to this limit. There isn't this ambiguity. This You can say um, this, this infinite judgment if, in Kant's terms, mm. this infinite judgment where you can go beyond the limit and it just keep going and going and going. And eventually it'll be like this, this uh, amb ambiguous stopping point. A cop can stop you at, if the speed limit's 55, a cop can stop you at 58, can stop you at 56 if it really wants to, right? And there's this questioning of, of how is the big other going to respond? But if you know how the big other is going to respond, as Todd believes we could, we should structure a state as, then this creates less ambiguity and more enjoyance for the subjects. And I think that's a, I think that's a good point. I, I agree with him on that point. It's really interesting because it's almost like the, the state, the big other likes the ambiguity because it wants to be like, if it feels like arresting you or feels like giving you yes. a ticket. And as opposed to if it like literally had to give you a ticket at 58, mm -hmm. then there's almost a way in which that gives power to the people, right? Because it's like, we can mm -hmm. force your hand, even if you're tired, even if you didn't sleep last night, you're going to have to pull me over and go through the bureaucratic motions of giving me a ticket. And it's almost like yeah. the very clear limit would then force the bureaucracy, if you will, to operate when the bureaucracy really only wants to operate when they want to operate according to their own agendas. Yes, and yes. Different I would things. definitely... Yeah, and it's a very Hegelian point where it's like where seemingly the state has more power. It's really the people that have the more power because you're making the state. You're you're the, the state is kind of capitulating to the people because they're saying at this point we will operate how you want us to. We will operate this way, and it will happen. There's not this question of we will operate when we want to, when we desire, when when, when us as a big other desires to operate and and engage with the subjects. And I think that that that's a good point that Todd makes, and that. Certainly, I think that um, a lot of people would freak back at because it sounds very authoritarian, right? You're creating this limit, and then once this limit hits, you're going to immediately like step in, right? But it's kind of the opposite. It's it, it's it's the it's the point that the people have more power, less authority is given to the state because the state's belief in the state may think they have more authority at this point because they're like, we can stop in, we've been at this point, and this will happen here and now, right? But for the people, it's like, well, now I know. I know what the big other is going to say. When I say Chevois, how will the big other respond, right? I know how it's going to respond when I hit over 58. 
It's interesting mm -hmm. to think that a problem of modern society is a lack of hard limits. Because there's something about... I would agree. You know, there's... Zizek, some... I was going to... Yeah, Zizek has a good example of the traditional father versus the postmodern father. The traditional father says, your grandma's sick, go visit her. The postmodern father says, your grandma's sick, but if you would really want to, if if you don't have time, that's okay. But if you want to, you can go visit her, right? And Zizek's point is that I want the traditional father. I want the state that says you're going to go visit her, right? This hard, fast limit gives, in a sense, more enjoyment to the subject than being left in this amb in this ambiguous position in relation to the other. No, I think there's a there's a bunch of points to it. I mean, if you read up on some of like Isaiah Berlin visiting his uh, Russian poet friends under the Soviet Union, like the horror of totalitarian. We hear totalitarianism and think that it was incredibly like. X caused Y, like very bam, bam, but actually it was more like an ambiguous environment of the secret police. You'd never it know was, when they're exactly. going to get you. You know, mm -hmm. we in the Western mind associate power with very, very forceful and clear, but no, totalitarianism. I would say to... this is, I would say, I would say this is due to Orwell. I would say Orwell has caused this. Oh, um, I actually, it's a, it's funny. I, I think you're right. I think Orwell, mm -hmm. um, you know, Neil Postman talks about the debate between Huxley and Orwell. To me, I always like to bring in Kafka because I think Kafka describes how power, especially today, operates. Like the trial we always talk about in the West, is it, you know, Brave New World or is it Big Brother, you know, big, you know, 1984. Mm -hmm. But really, it's the trial. Really, it's the castle. Mm -hmm. Really, it's a little fable. That's what we see today. Um, and that mm -hmm. that is the ambiguous space, right? Like, look how Joseph K. It's your fault. You know, you're like at the end when they're going to stab him, they turn the knife to mm -hmm. him. Like they turn it around, like, hey, you're you're going to take it? You're going to do it? Like Joseph mm -hmm. K, in his very effort to stand against power because power operates in an ambiguous space, precisely participates in the power that leads to his execution. Uh, he is his own mm -hmm. trial, basically. Um, and I would mm -hmm. also argue that probably the crime, if I were to really go on a limb, probably the crime that Joseph K committed was that he violated some social norm. You know how like when you put a mm -hmm. coat on a table, like you have a chair and there's a coat over it, that means you're not supposed to sit there, right? And you sit, there, yeah. You know, there's not any sort of hard law that says you're not supposed to do it, but it kind of is mm -hmm. concrete at the same time. Joseph K. all throughout the trial is constantly violating social norms. And it's almost like the trial is an example of a world where there was legal force to back up social norms. And the problem with social mm -hmm. norms, the reason they're so terrifying um, is because mm -hmm. they are ambiguous, right? Like, do I, you know, do I, can I date the lawyer's daughter? Can I sit, you know, visit the painter upstairs? Like it's, it, and then also just by the logistical structure of the trial, you know, the, the artist is up in an attic and he has to climb out a window. It's like a dream state and the courtroom is in some random building somewhere. Well, that's like social norms. You go in a restaurant and you're on trial because there are social norms that you're supposed to say hi to all the older people before you sit down, right? You know, you're not supposed, you're supposed mm -hmm. to shake hands, not, you know, do something else, right? And you're supposed to give a firm handshake, not a fish handshake, right? There are all these kind of mm -hmm. social norms that are everywhere all the time. And it does help me think about mm -hmm. Kafka because he himself, I, as I understand it, although he was actually apparently a much happier and more comic people than people realize, I think he was probably more mm. socially inept. And I, and you do feel that. Like when you walk into a place you've never been before, you're like, oh, there's like norms. What are the norms? I don't even know. Am I doing something mm -hmm. wrong? Am I not doing something wrong? Um, and I think that's what the trial is constantly exploring, actually. And that, too, describes exactly how the big other operates, right? You know, are you doing something wrong to mm -hmm. even entertain the possibility of QAnon? Are you doing something wrong to be searching, like, to be investigating the government? Is that okay? You know, I'm looking for, like, a lot of people when they go to file their taxes, right? They're like, should I take deductibles? What if it, what if taking de deductibles <laughs> increases the likelihood of getting audited, right? There's all these decisions you have yeah. to make where you exist in this ambiguous space where literally if there was something at the top of your tax form that said, if you take off more than 200,000 of deductibles, your likelihood, you will be audited to make sure that that's legitimate. You would go, mm -hmm. okay, great. As opposed yeah. to what the IRS loves to do is randomness, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and that is more totalitarian because to go back to the, um, to go back to the speed limit example, if I knew I could hit 58 
and force the government to act. They have to do something against me. That gives me a kind of power over them. And then what's likely is that the government would be a lot more careful before it passed laws. It's like, crap, mm -hmm. if we have to literally enforce every law, then we better not pass so many. What they love is mm -hmm. what the in a forced environment, you would take choice from the big other. Like that you would remove choice from them. And that's really where the horror comes. Mm -hmm. They get to choose if they give you a speeding ticket or not. Uh, you know, and that what is what you would remove in a hard limit uh, environment. You could force them to act, uh, which would then probably reduce the amount of law that exists, which then would be good. Uh, and then also it would give sense more. It would give people more of a sense. Well, then they would have the enjoyment of having a power over the state. Right. Like because mm -hmm. they'd be like, we have some level of power over because we can force its hand, which one of the whole reasons people seem to go into conspiracies. It's almost like two things. Like in a conspiracy, there is a kind of hard limit from what you can know and not. You can't access the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. You can't reach Q unless he chooses it. Like there are these hard limits. Mm -hmm. And then also there's a kind of power in it as well, right? Because you're you're able to get an enjoyment in having that secret knowledge or also in knowing that those limits are there. So it's interesting to think of a conspiracy mm -hmm. as kind of what people lead, and then I'll give it to you. It's interesting to think of a conspiracy as something that maybe people are more prone to fall into because of a lack of hard limits, like a hard speed limit. Uh, and it's like a, it's a way of getting a sense of a footing or a feeling of power and ergo enjoyment mm -hmm. in an ambiguous world. This is certainly something, this, this, this type of ambiguity is one thing I touch about in the Kanye West example, where Kanye kind of, because Kanye's bipolar, and so he, he's, he's constantly oscillating, but manic in a depressive state. And he sees this caricature of the Jew as who can kind of give him a stable ground. Throughout all of his manic and depression, he can always go, it's this person's fault. It's this caricature's fault, right? And this and, and this is his way of avoiding the ambiguity. Because when you're bipolar, there isn't like a set time. It isn't like at 5 p.m. I will become manic, right? right, right. It isn't at 8 p.m. I will become depressive. It's just very ambiguous. It just happens. Um and it maybe it doesn't just happen. You can get into the psychoanalysis of it, but it in it's seemingly to the subject, it just happens, right? Sure. And for Kanye, it gives him this 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 clear stable ground, a quilting point, if you will, to use the term. This the, this quilting of all the signifiers, all the signifiers of his desires, whether he's manic, whether he's feeling his desires and depression, this quilting point quilts it all together in the caricature of the Jew. And that's why it's so powerful for Kanye and for a lot of people who are psychotics, which is why I assign deception to be and conspiratorial sub subjectivity tend to be in the position of the psychosis, right? Um, in future writings, I do want to explain how it can be in position of neurosis and per and, and uh, perversity and hysteria. But I think that the main point of clinical structure for conspiratorial sub is psychosis because it's this it's this complete fear of ambiguity and trying to reach out and affirm a stable something and for both kanye this the, this caricature of the jew is at once a stable quilting point that's also who his point of deception goes into so we can last or uh put his view of deception towards this figure and also this figure will always remain as that figure of deception throughout all of his ambiguities of manic depressive states. That's really interesting to tie in the kind of inherent ambiguity of bipolar with the conspiracy because, mm -hmm. you know, because it gives a kind of stability, right? Because you have this mm -hmm. constant figure of the Jew that is always there keeping you from it that then if you don't get to the Jew, that confirms that the Jew is keeping you from it, that then provides mm -hmm. a certain stability. You can rely on that reality uh, to hold you together. It's funny to mm -hmm. think that, so then you could say if with bipolar, there's an ambiguity just in your very daily life, that then if everything is ambiguous, because everything is run by the Jews, you're normal. Because the world is kind of a random crazy place that has a certain mm -hmm. ambiguity to it. And the fact that your life is ambigu ambiguous means that you're fitted to it. You align with it. This is how mm -hmm. the world is. There's nothing wrong with you because, you know, things are actually ultimately arbitrary and ultimately have a certain degree of unpredictability to it. And ultimately, there's a kind of ambiguity to everything. It's a very interesting. So then mm -hmm. I wonder, to the point as well, if indeed there is something about modern life 
or whatever that means, life in 2023, that perhaps is a little more schizophrenic in the Deleuzian sense, because he talks about schizopolitics and kind of how the subject today has a certain schizophrenia to them, even if they don't want to, just because of digital media and all of these different things. Is that in of itself, then meaning the average person as a baseline is more like the bipolar, although of course bipolar and schizophrenic are not the same thing, but in the schizophrenic, there's an ambiguity, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can think of uh, John Nash talking about the skin, the same voice that tells him there are aliens is the one that gives him solutions to the Ryman hypothesis, right? So there's an ambiguity mm -hmm. if it's craziness, because, you know, he says that at the beginning of the Beautiful Mind book, where he's like, they're like, why do you believe all this stuff with the aliens? Why do you believe in the CIA operations? Like, well, you know, the same voice that told me about game theory is the voice that told me about the operation. So, you know, there's uh, there's an ambiguity between if that voice is crazy or if it's genius itself because it's giving you both, right? So there's an mm -hmm. ambiguity in that sort of take on the schizophrenic. And also there's an ambiguity on what personalities are real, what are not, and so on. So if there is something mm -hmm. about modern life that leads people in more of a schizophrenic direction, uh, which then perhaps that's another reason why conspiracies are so favorable, because in the midst of that feeling mm -hmm. of the schizophrenic, you have this reliability of Q. Q becomes the reliable mm -hmm. source. Uh, and then if you can't access Q, that only confirms Q. And so it's a like, you know, as, as I talked about in the paper, inspired by your book, it's like um, Desire's mm -hmm. Masterpiece, really, uh, because it's mm -hmm. Because you never have to worry about it going away. And in a world that feels so radically ambiguous and crazy, uh, if you will, then the only thing reliable has to be some kind of desire, especially if God is dead and so on and so forth, some kind of de desire that is constant. Well, that would only even theoretically be a desire that's inability to realize precisely is the desire or confirms the desire. Yes, and that's uh, what I would say conspiracy is. Because the whole point of conspiracy is that I, I, I believe I use the term you don't want the the truth of conspiracy to unroll like in like an ancient Arabic like carpet. There is no carpet that rolls out this this map of meaning to use the term that rolls out that would tell you all the truths of the world. Because if the, if one conspiracy tells the spiritual subject all the truths of the world, they no longer want to look into conspiracy, right? So they're always trying to maintain this position of. Well, this conspiracy isn't entirely accurate, but maybe this next one is. And then if I bring it into my web of conspiracies, maybe I'll get close to the truth. But if they were to say, I have reached the truth, this would be traumatic for them. Kind of like how, and this is a this is a Baudrillardian example, how the how someone who's collecting baseball cards, once they reach that last baseball cards, if they if this is their like focus in life and they reach that last baseball cards, it's all over. What are they gonna do now? They've completed the collection of baseball cards, just as if a conspiratorial subject completes the collection of conspiracies. What are they to do now? There's there's nowhere else to go. And that's why they have to maintain that distance, which is why a collector never wants to collect everything. They may say, well, my goal is to collect every famous comic book or every famous um I said comic book because my dad's a comic collector, so he loves collecting comics. But um, but every every famous um baseball card, every famous uh, edition of Lacan's seminars, right? But they don't really want to because what do they do afterwards? They move on to a new collection and they move on to another one. But each time they and they feel this sense of completeness, but it's distraught with the with an emptiness, right? Because there's no more to collect. There's no more to put their desire towards. The 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 object A has been realized in this sense, and I have to visit a new one, right? No, I think that's exactly right. And the thing is about like with baseball cards you are in a way responsible if you don't have all the fancy baseball cards, right? Yes. Because there's no theoretical reason why you can't gain them. So there's a certain responsibility pushing you to the depth of the desire because you, mm -hmm. you're kind of pushed by, I could get them all, I want them all, so why don't I get them all, right? And if I don't get them all, then the people around me know I don't have them all and I don't like them knowing I don't have them all because I want to be the world's best collector. So these are kind of game theory dynamic, if you will, pushing you to finish the collection, right? Both being because mm -hmm. of what you're the gaze of the other, your own responsibility. And you also with the baseball cards, if you knew consciously that you were intentionally providing an obstacle to yourself from getting the last card, well, then you would know you would do that and it would it would cease to be effective, right? Because you would know you were self-sabotaging. Self-sabotage only works if you don't know you're self-sabotaging. So it goes with self-deception. The moment you're engaged yes. in self-deception, yes. crap. Uh, so 
whenever you're dealing with like something like baseball cards or cards or lovers or whatever, there's a game theory dynamic that almost inevitably leads you to an exhaustion and completion of that desire. That's why the conspiracy mm -hmm. is so problematic because it mm -hmm. actually creates the perfect way to where you never reach the truth. And that doesn't mean you, you never have to necessarily face the reality that you're self-sabotaging yourself. You never have to mm -hmm. necessarily face the reality that you're in the, in the, um, you're, you're engaging in self-deception because the very mm -hmm. inability to reach the core of the conspiracy is evidence of the conspiracy. And yes. even yes. if, and, and then here's the other key to it. Even if you heard me say, someone in QAnon heard me say exactly everything I just said, and they listened to this conversation we were having, they could go, that's true. Those flat earthers sure should listen to this conversation because yeah. you and I, you know, they really need to. Yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of the, I think, I, I didn't, at this point, I, when I was writing this, I, I hadn't read Phenomenology of Spirit yet. But now that I have, I, if I was to write some of this again, I would talk about the notion of the beautiful soul mm. and that but but not but not just the conspiratorial subject that's the easy answer is that the conspiratorial subject believes they're a beautiful soul and they believe that like everyone every other conspiracy is crazy right someone who's a someone who believes in um flat earth would go well of course flat earth is real we have this that and this and the other but nasa you think hold on you think you the moon landing what what like stuff like that right and um and and this but that that's the easy answer i think but the harder answer to um to qu come to is the real is coming to the real that we are not beautiful souls all of us also have conspiratorial aspects right there isn't like this conspiratorial subject that exists outside of us and that exists in this like unknown land right that's not us that's not our friends we have conspiratorial aspects right and 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 coming to the realization that yes we we are also conspiratorial subjects in a sense even if we don't believe in these QAnon or anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, we still have these various beliefs about our world that some people would probably clarify as conspiracy theories, right? And so it's coming to realize that we are not exempt from the badness of the world. We're not this knight of virtue, which is standing in opposition to the conspiracies in the world. And we're, we have like a bubble around us. No, it's none of that. It's that we are also engaged in conspiracies and that if we can all come to recognize this, we can all try and get past conspiracies. And in a sense, that's what my concept of unconspiracy is. But that may be a little bit too much to go into right now. But yeah, no, that's a that's a that was all tremendous, and I really like the unconspiracy uh, that you described. Well, mm -hmm. th I think what's so critical is one of the reasons why taking Lacan seriously and central, as opposed to say adding Lacan to Deleuze or adding Lacan to Christian. Like you really need to make Lacan central to your understanding of the subject because that's the only way to make you. To like you susceptible to Lacan, like you have to take seriously what he's teaching as opposed like because otherwise you're probably just going to talk Lacan, not live Lacan, if you grant me mm -hmm. that sort of language. Right. You know, one yeah. of the things that like Christianity would emphasize is that we're all sinners. But then, of course, problematically, like ideology can get where I know we're all sinners more so than you. So I'm better than you. Right. So you're, there's all yes. these ways to engage in gymnastics to make the other more guilty than you. And one of the most difficult things in the world seems to be to truly believe that everyone is, you know, we want to talk about equality today, but not equality in terms of self-delusion, self-deception and all that. We want to talk about equality in terms of like, well, frankly, the kind of a delusion diversity, really. Like we're all equal in our difference. And that difference has an inherent value in its own right that we should be free to express. And I'm not countering any of that, but all of that does run the risk of being in service of a realization that helps you avoid the real that then must be confronted if we're going to have any hope, uh, dare I say, of not having some pathological breakdown uh, on a large scale or just more and mm -hmm. more conspiracies that come about, right? Like there's nothing wrong mm -hmm. with realization if it comes after or from a, con a, confront a confronting of the real. It's just the mm -hmm. case that we tend to realize away from the real to go back to the Zipani yes. distinction. It makes me think of, um, I do always like Lewis, that first thing first principle. He says, if you put first things first, you get second things also. But if you put second things first, you lose both. I think that describes a lot of hmm. life. Uh, and I think that's quite useful too. Like there's nothing wrong with expression. Just, an ex just um, there's something wrong with an expression that's helping you avoid your own tendencies of self-deception and so on and so forth. But if you face that mm -hmm. and then work toward individual mm -hmm. expression or so on, that that's fine. Um, but it seems to be 
very easy for us not to do that. And I, I think too, like as long the the key, I think to it all, well, not to it all, but to a lot, we have to, as you know, like I like to emphasize, we have to understand that thought itself naturally structures in terms of conspiracy, that the difference between a worldview and a conspiracy in terms of the structure of thought to itself is zero. Like they have the same structure. The difference is correspondence, right? Like mm. rationality, um, unbound from having to correspond with anything real, uh, can relate to itself infinitely and generate any sort of logic that is coherent with itself, right? Like what is a worldview? Like what's the line between a conspiracy, a worldview, and an ideology? The line is exactly, very yes. it's very thin. <laughs> it's, it seems that it seems that the difference would be does the big other call this a conspiracy? Um in a sense, is that is this declared a conspiracy by the big other? Which then throws the whole question of what is a conspiracy? Because if, if if it's conspiracy is only what the big other calls a conspiracy, then aren't you still capitulating to the big other when you engage in conspiracy theories? And so it's like it's th there's no way there's no way to win. What you just said is to me an example mm -hmm. of why this topic of conspiracies is so critical. Because I feel as if the topic of conspiracies, if you look at it clearly, you get to like the very core. Of the deepest problems of epistemology and by extension ontology that there is because then the question mm. is what is the kind of being that the human subject is to be able to successfully operate in the world according to a structure of thought that's really difficult to tell the difference between ideology worldview and conspiracy right mm -hmm. like the other thing too that's so critical there is such thing as true conspiracy right the tuskegee syphilis yes, experiments I, I point and, that out yes exactly right and so it's so easy the problem with the word conspiracy today is that um, the moment you call it a conspiracy, you disqualify it, right? Yes. You know, it's off the table, right? Well, that might be what the big other wants. But then, of course, the people in the conspiracy would say, exactly. You're calling us mm -hmm. a conspiracy because the big other doesn't want the conspiracy to come to light, right? So that's yes. another reason why it's a desire's masterpiece, because the very calling of the conspiracy confirms the legitimacy of the conspiracy. Yes, this is this is this is an example. I'll tie it back to Kanye again. When Kanye had that very famous tweet where he was like, um, I'm gonna declare Death Con three on Jews or whatever, right? And this and he got banned off Twitter for this, right? Well, this just confirmed everyone that, that that believed that Jews were running Twitter or Jews were running everything. This just confirmed everything for them because they see this and they go, "Well, okay, he's calling out. He's calling it out. He's saying this is it." And then he's getting you know shut down, right? And 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 this is this is not how we should act towards conspiracy theories. I think because this just confirms it. This makes it worse. Everyone who saw that that was already believing this was confirmed. They're like, "Oh, it's it's undeniable now." He's been shut down out of everything. He just because he said this one word, right? And I think that this is not how we should deal with these types of people. I think that instead, what we should try and do, we should try and explain to them well, what what they see as the conspiracy is really their own deception, their own self deception, deceiving themselves. And I've done this to a couple of people where I'm like, well, yeah, it's not stuff like that, but it's more stuff like COVID COVID conspiracies, where I'm like, well. Sure, you can you can string all these various events together and kind of create this incoherent story that may seem coherent if it's a first glance. But what you're really doing is you're just kind of saying that you're placing faith that that what the news is telling you is always wrong. So you're placing faith in deception. And I've I've had a couple of people be like, well, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, hasn't been entirely successful yet. But I think that if we can try and come to realize that these these people are not just shouldn't shouldn't just be casted out of society but rather that they can come to realize their own self-deception i think this will all i think this will help everyone right well what you're getting at so i think we've made you know excellent because in the same way that hegel's like how do you know we can't reach the thing in of itself unless you reach the thing of itself right you know likewise the yeah. media is like if they're always lying to you you know how do you know that right like there's this kind of way which you are assuming that you can never trust the media because that's what you need that's like the axiomatic assumption you need for your world yes. or your conspiracy axiom one right? can't trust the media okay axiom two you can't trust the government okay cool now we're good now we can create conspiracies right there's these two axioms and if you and if you don't buy into them then you can't really engage in conspiratorial thinking to the extent that covid vaccine theories and anti-semitic conspiracy theories are you have to buy into the axiom that there is and that that's why i define conspiracy 
um, in the first part of my book as, hold on, let me, let me pull it up. Yes. So it is conspiracy as an attempt to explain events as mediated and contingent on a non-lacking big other, which doubles itself and the subject's assumption of deception on behalf of the big other. Yep. This, uh, this point of attempting to explain events is very important for conspiracy because it's not just saying this, this is, this is how, an, this is how a uh, event is. And it's that simple. It's this attempt. It's this, well, this is how the event seems to everyone else, but actually I'm going to give an attempt to explain what it really means. Um, I believe the um, I believe Zizek has used the term. It's a hermeneutic suspicion, right. the belief that there is a meaning underlying everything. And as Freud says, sometimes you just want to smoke a cigar. <laughs> sometimes you just want to have a cigar. There isn't there isn't an oral fixation involved. Not not always. It's just you want to have a cigar. Um, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, I think, is the quote. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, a few things. Um one of the things that ends up happening is like every worldview, every ideology, every conspiracy, and it is interesting to think those three, has to have some sort of axioms that kind of mm -hmm. underline it, that it operates. And for me, one of the tricks that people kind of uh, maintain their ideology is they get to decide what's an axiom and what's not, right? Like mm -hmm. axioms don't tell you I'm an axiom. You get to decide. And then, of course, most people don't even call it an axiom because once you do that, you kind of have to face the reality you're assuming it. And once you do that, you go, why am I assuming it? So what ends up happening is that people practically choose axioms in a manner that mm -hmm. they do it without realizing it. So basically what ends up happening is there's an axiom you cannot trust the media, right? And mm -hmm. you, never, you never let yourself constantly realize that you've chosen this. You just do one day. Yes. Uh, I like to, the way in the paper, compelling, most people believe what they do from a kind of absorbing. You just kind of mm. absorb something and it becomes what you operate by without thinking about it. Now, mm -hmm. there's a strong argument to be made that humans would go crazy if they didn't absorb some degree of what they know, right? Yes. Like this is a problem. Like if Gödel is right, then every worldview will ultimately have some essential incompleteness to it, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we get to choose what that is and that's the danger. We get to choose what the essential incompleteness is, and that's why we're always at risk as something conspiratorial. If indeed every worldview, now of course, then we can get into Hegel with: is it possible to have a presupposition less? But for philosophy as a whole, gate or different people yes. talk about. You know, that's a fun topic, and I think it's actually uh -huh. important. Um, but generally, most people are operating in the realm of understanding, not reason, one-sidedness, yes. and that's where you're going to have the Kurt Gödel stuff uh, really apply. So we all get to choose the essential point of incompleteness. Maybe that's, you know, you can't observe God, God exists, but you couldn't observe him because it would kill you. Well, then it's mm -hmm. okay. Then that's going to function in your theology. Also, I mm -hmm. think what you see in the conspiracy and worldviews in general is that they all have a theological structure. There's a lot yes. more theological structure going on than people realize. Um, and that would also suggest that the, the structure of theology is, could be an insight into how conspiracies and things operate uh, versus, say, the content of them. Uh, because what you see, like mm -hmm. you described it very well, like if God, uh, the, the hiddenness of God, rather it be Dante or Moses or different things, like God has to hide himself because if he revealed himself to you before you were ready, it would kill you, right? So you have to work mm -hmm. towards sainthood to the place where you're worthy of experiencing God without being destroyed and anything less would kill you, right? Well, that could be true or it could be false, but the notion is that there is a movement of the, the, the only way to be worthy of experiencing God or able to experience mm -hmm. God would be what Dante says, is you have to go deeper into Christianity, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's like yes. a conspiracy. The only way to encounter more truth from QAnon, from Q, is to go deeper into QAnon. And of course, the deeper you go into QAnon, the more it- The more you accept the axioms. Exactly, mm -hmm. by definition. And then, mm -hmm. of course, by accepting the axioms for so long, giving them up would cost you more. It'd be more painful, right? Like if you, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you, uh, if you spend a week trying to be a state champion wrestler and then find out you suck, you know, that yeah, it was a waste of a week, but that's one thing. But if you spent years and then got to the place where you weren't going to get to the state championship, that's a little more painful to deal with. And you might not yeah. want to accept that reality. And of course, there's benefits to doing something you fail at like sports anyway. I'm not saying there isn't. But the point is that it's more difficult to give something up the more time you put into mm -hmm. it. So if the, the structure of the conspiracy is the only way to see more of the truth, is to go deeper into it. That also creates more of an attachment to the conspiracy that makes it more difficult to get away from. So you go to, and the same goes with worldview in general, right? And here's mm -hmm. the key, regardless if the worldview is true or not, 
this structure is in applied. But the very mm -hmm. fact that it's applied regardless, regardless if it's true or not, means we are all vulnerable to this structure and that just having the truth, quote unquote, doesn't mean we're free yeah. from it. Because I think that's what most people think. And of course, by definition, whatever you think you think is true, because you wouldn't think it if you didn't think it was true. So if you believe yeah. something, you believe it's true. Well, right there in the very necessary feeling that what you believe is true, you position yourself, if you're not careful, as never being possible of falling into a conspiracy. Because a conspiracy mm -hmm. doesn't have the structure of truth. And it's also obviously a conspiracy because the Big Brother said it was. Uh, you know, And so mm -hmm. that then is one of the very things that makes you put your guard down that then makes you more susceptible to it. And that's where I think we've really made mm -hmm. a mistake and I'll give it back to you in a moment, is, is that we kind of are like, oh, if you were really rational, if you really pursued the truth, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't be in a conspiracy. Then you wouldn't fall into these things. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. rationality mm -hmm. and the feeling of truth is precisely what gets you in it and keeps you in it. So there has to be another metric. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I, I'll note, and I'll give it back to you, my friend Lorenzo, who helps people come out of conspiracies, one of the ways he's found to do it, like you're talking about unveiling the mechanisms of self-deception, I definitely think describing the structure of how it works is very, very helpful. Because if you can see the structure, then you can see how it kind of self-confirms itself and traps you. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. But another thing he'll do is he'll actually use probability markets to like say, oh, I tell you what, if take a take a thousand dollars, put it on the mm -hmm. probability market that say Trump will lose the election or he'll win or there'll be the storm or all the QAnon stuff. And if it's true, just because of how probability markets work, you'll make $50,000. And it's funny mm -hmm. that if you make people put money on their beliefs, because why wouldn't you do yeah. that? Why wouldn't you mm -hmm. do that? You could turn a thousand into 50,000. Why wouldn't you do that? Suddenly they go, oh, wait a minute. Let me think about that for a minute. And boom, yeah. now you've got them to the place of thinking mm -hmm. about what they're thinking. And it actually goes to show how money, money in some circumstances, unless it gets captured by capital in problematic ways, but that would be an example where actually like money or skin in the game of some kind can be mm -hmm. extremely useful for helping people escape forms of self-deception mm -hmm. and so on and so yeah. forth. Definitely. I, I think this kind of demonstrates that this example you gave, it shows how even those who seem so hard-aligned in the conspiracy theories, they still maintain a gap between the thing, the thing, the the traumatic thing and and the and their and you know themselves. They have to retain this gap. And I think that they try and overshed this gap. They try and say, oh, if, I feel like if Lorenzo was to ask that person, would you put money on the table? They'd go, yes, yes, of course I would. I believe it. But then he goes, okay, do it. And that's where the gap is. Yeah. The gap is between, would you do it? Yes, of course. Of course I would do this. But then the gap comes in. Well, no, I will. You want me to, oh, you want me to actually do it? Which I think is, uh, I feel like that's a common um, statement by people sometimes. You'll say something and you're like, well, would you do this for a thousand dollars? And <laughs> something crazy like, um, go like run down the street with, with no under one for, for $500. And if they're like, well, yeah, I do that. $500 is so easy. Right. But if you pulled out $500 and said, okay, yeah, I'm ready. Please. They would wait, wait, hold on. Wait. Oh, you meant like actually do it. You meant like actually. And it's this gap between fully believing, fully taking on absorbing to use your term, absorbing this as a truth in your in your subjectivity and not just what you are saying you can say you would do this right but there's that gap between saying and actually going and doing it that i think conspiratorial subjects very few would actually overcome if any oh yeah it's like when they were talking about all the people are like we're gonna go take on area 51 we're gonna storm at area 51 <laughs> and there was that one naruto runner who actually went down there with yeah and naruto he actually runner. did it yeah and everyone's like it. yeah it, and I'm sure everyone that said they're going to do it is like, wait, he actually did it. What the f We man? just said we're going to do it. Yeah, we maintained a gap. Why, why did you actually go and do it, right? And yeah. that's actually another great example of the Kafka stuff because it's like, didn't you yeah. know the rules? Like the guy broke the rules. That's like yeah. Joseph K out there doing the Naruto run. He's like, he broke the rules. He actually went and did it. Which yeah. then, of course, <laughs> probably everyone, and maybe, I don't know, uh, I, I every single internet conversation now has to reference Gerard. Uh, so I'll, I'll hesitate, but you know, there's almost a scapegoat there where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's like the guy who actually did it is the a-hole. 
Because that shows that mm -hmm. all of us could have done it and we didn't, which then reflects back on us to make the ground of our community seem false and inauthentic. If nobody would have stormed Area 51, the ground of our community would have been authentic and we all would have gotten mm -hmm. it, wink, wink. But this one guy ruined it for everyone by doing what we actually said. Freaking jerk. Uh, so now, you know, so there's a kind of like, he's an idiot. Like there's this, like right there, there's this mm -hmm. kind of like, he's an idiot. And then everyone... And then, and then it's kind of funny because that guy's now like a legend precisely because he was the idiot. Yeah. And so he's kind of raised to this sort of mm -hmm. legendary status precisely because now the community can say, oh, we're all the guys who knew the truth that it was absurd, which this Naruto guy unveiled to us. And we can all, all have a community of having really understood the rules because of this Naruto running guy. So it's funny that you almost do see mm -hmm. a kind of deification into the legendary folklore of this one person in the same act yeah. of like not getting the rules. Like you're not supposed to actually go to Area 51, you mm -hmm. dick. Uh, in the yeah. same way that there's almost something about the entire January 6th stuff that was where like, there was clearly way mm -hmm. more QAnon and you mentioned January 6th in your book and I really like that analysis. There's mm -hmm. way more people across the country who felt the way of the January 6th people. And those same people are like, you idiots, you weren't supposed to actually yeah. go to DC and do that. What the frick are you doing? You're unveiling us. And then everyone, because of that, is kind of like, uh, maybe we shouldn't be entertaining all of this thinking about Trump and stealing the election or showing because look what it might cause. Mm -hmm. But then people engage in kind of ideological structures where then when the January 6th people all go to jail in the same way that you shut down Kenya from Twitter, which then confirms it, then people like the people who the wider public who are mm -hmm. speaking about the election being stolen, then because of the response to January 6, then can sort of say, well, maybe that actually confirms the January 6 people were correct, which they kind of have to believe in order to maintain their ideology, but also don't mm -hmm. want to be the people to go and act. So it's interesting because it's almost like what you see there is if someone violates the sacred oath of never acting on what you talk about, like there's like a sacred mm -hmm. unspoken rule where you're not supposed to do it, you see how quickly ideology is looking for a way to kind of like repair the damage. And so much mm. of that relies on how people respond to say Kanye on Twitter. Like you were saying, once you ban him, that just confirms, right? That there's some other, the Jews that are running the country. So Kanye actually gets more powerful. Likewise, if you're not careful with the January 6th, that actually then can keep alive the people who thought that way but didn't act on it and this starts to show why trump is leading in the republic like how in the world can trump be leading the republican mm -hmm. like field after january 6th yeah. and everything he did because of the response now i'm not saying that you should have therefore done nothing but i don't think we'd say let me put it this way without mm -hmm. lacan and books like yours um i don't think we can think political response like we haven't mm -hmm. thought political response in the best way to politically respond to situations like that or legal, you know, governmentally respond mm -hmm. because we really don't understand Lacan. Like yeah. if the government took seriously Lacan, then you would think real hard about how you responded to not unintentionally um, create, uh, strengthen the ideology that you're trying to correct. So I like, it really is, I think, quite a problem. And I'll give it back to you. I just reflecting on what you were saying, it really is quite a problem when you have a state that is not responding aware of Lacan, right? Because this can feed some of the problems that supposedly we're going to correct. But then we can say maybe they want to do that, right? Because then it makes them mm -hmm. like stay in power to stop the idea. We can play all sorts of games uh, yeah. in different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm speaking more about QAnon again. QAnon, there's, I'm, there's evidence the so QAnon kind of started as 4chan by people ironically say this. We're going to ironically say this. But then other people saw it and took it as truth. And right. then those people that started it as a joke were like, wait, we were just saying that. We were just saying that there was some guy Q that ran everything. We didn't, like, really? You actually believe that? Like, what? Like, and, and, and. And that's kind of the same way, like, with the Naruto guy, I feel like, is that the, the, the people that started the Area 51 thing. We're not the ones that did it. The Naruto guy wasn't the one that started the movement. He was just a random guy that bought too much into it, that that didn't realize the gap that everyone else had between that and it, between doing so and saying it. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's just, I think that's just really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's funny to think that what if 
what if the best thing the government could do is have a congressional panel where you have the leaders of the QAnon conspiracy come and present their evidence? We're like, okay, yeah. well, come on up, guys. <laughs> Show us what it is. Exactly. And it's, yeah. And I think that some, like Jonathan Routes in his great book, Kindly Inquisitors, talking about free speech, like the point he keeps making is like the point of free speech is precisely to let bigots speak and unveil their bigotry, right? Now, because if you don't do exactly. that, then then you maintain a gap that keeps it alive and that being really problematic. Mm-hmm. Now, I think it gets interesting when you start talking about deep fakes, you know, all of the false information, yeah. you don't have legit, you have a, the Habermas legitimization crisis and so on and so forth. But the main point, regardless of what one thinks, is that there is something about transparency that destroys the gap. And if, you, you know, a lot of people are like, but wait a minute, if we had a congressional panel where we let all the QAnon supporters speak, wouldn't that legitimize QAnon? Um, that's kind of the fear, right? No. <laughs> but it's the exact yeah, opposite. Yeah. Uh, because it's the the gap is what legitimizes. The gap, quote unquote, legitimizes yes. or keep alive. So the name of political response must be the removal of gaps as quickly as possible. If you don't remove the gaps... That's going to be the problem. Mm-hmm. So we need to think about political and this, response and removing this, gaps. Yeah. And this this flows right into the notion of ambiguity. Where yeah. you're talking about ambiguity is kind of like a gap. This gap between what is the other really saying? My my guessing, okay, what does the other really mean? And removing this gap is the same way that I think removing the gaps in terms of conspiracy, letting the QAnon people speak, removing that gap removing the gap between oh it's actually 58 where, where you'll get pulled over even though the sign says 55 removing that gap removing gaps does seem to be sort of like a very like basic statement but it's a very powerful i think political statement which could do a lot of work for a political project for sure well you know i mm-hmm. i like a lot of um i call them the the modern counter enlightenment thinkers kind of you had the counter enlightenment mm-hmm. starting with the co harm and the scottish enlightenment and i think there was an entire line line of thinkers like uh, marcis blondel mckay Ponier, benjamin mm-hmm. fondain etc so forth you could even say bergson and whitehead uh, owen barfield who were really um they didn't fit into the popular discourse of philosophy so they didn't exist because if you don't fit in the discourse you don't exist right uh but you know blondel yeah. You know, his book on action basically suggests that metaphysics is action. And by metaphysics, he's also talked about backgrounds and so on and so forth. So if you want to get at a metaphysics, then you always need to allow action or allow action. He Mm -hmm. makes a distinction also basically between acts and action, where acts is kind of Mm -hmm. mindless things, whereas action is where you're kind of bringing forth the truth. And it kind of has a Heideggerian flavor as well about being different things. Uh, He sounds a little influenced by someone like Giovanni Gentile because yeah because Gentile would be the whole point is that all that exists is action and that individuals are just kind of like units of action and that taking these units of action together creates one unit of action and that being the state and the state's the biggest unit unit of action which gives the, the ability to act for all individuals and that's kind of the metaphysics and statehood of Gentile and that sounds a lot like Blondell um, hmm. where and I think the the notion of action and metaphysics is certainly something that's touched upon by Fichte, Kant. I mean, Fichte was the one that said, like, the, all the self is is an action, right? It's the positing of the I and the not I. Uh, for Hegel, the self is a simultaneous action. It's both the subject and the object. But for thinking, you the, the, the thought doesn't just, like, go externally. The thought stays in the subject, thereby creating both something which creates the thought and something which receives the thought, a subject and an object. So the subject is both. Um, so I definitely think action is important for metaphysics, and it's been touched upon a lot. Um, but yeah, that's what I want to say. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, so for Blondel, mm-hmm. like if you were looking at QAnon, and that's very interesting with the po- possible connections there, I'm not sure. Um, but like so for Blondel, what he would say is mm-hmm. we have to do everything in our power to make QAnon not engage in act, but action, because act is a mechanism of mm. hiding from your metaphysics and your truth claims. You could even say your exclu- exclusive truth claims. So like when you let, say, QAnon mm-hmm. operate on the Internet and its own Q, um, uh, 4chan net, net boards or whatever, there's a lot of acting, mm-hmm. acting. But what we need is action. And that would be a congressional panel where you let the QAnon people put forth their ideas, because now it's almost like action like yeah. a movie starts like let's go whereas acting is performative mm-hmm. right 
So what mm -hmm. ends up happening like that, yeah. for Blondell is most people spend their lives acting, but mm -hmm. never engaging in action. Because then action would force you to confront what you believe. And boy, howdy, that sucks. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. what you, so what you have to do is politically, you have to think in terms of, okay, how do we make people move from acting to action? Because that is to kind of close the um, gap and therefore mm -hmm. remove mechanisms of self-deception and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, self-sabotage as well. And I think very often the, the state and frankly, uh, people in general, we tend to operate in how do we stop acting? And you see, when you stop acting, you never stop acting because people find new mm. ways to act and to engage in act. What you got to show is how do we enable action, right? So instead of trying to um, end acting, and then you're still operating within acting where the self-deception and the self-sabotage and all that operates, you say, no, no, no. How do we enable action, which would force people to come to terms, you know, to face and to actually, you know, say what they believe and do what they believe, uh, where there are real stakes. And that seems to have a lot to do with how you can fight a QAnon, because just as soon as you say, hey, man, you know, um, give me a thousand bucks. And if, and if the storm happens, you make 50,000, which you think is going to happen. Why would you mm -hmm. not do that? That would be an example of yeah. action as opposed to acting. Mm -hmm. Acting is the speaking. Hey, would you uh, would you spend five hundred dollars to run down the street in your underwear? And then this person says, absolutely. When you pull out the $500, now we're in the mm -hmm. realm of action. We've moved from acting mm -hmm. to action. And it would seem mm -hmm. to be a political framing is, and arguably on ourselves too. Like when you look at yourself, you say, how do I be a subject that is more in the business of acting? I mean, of action, because we're naturally in the business of acting. How do I actually engage in action more than acting? And that seems to have confronting the real a little bit. Um, and then, of course, Zupancha's distinction, realization tends to favor ac acting, whereas the real mm -hmm. tends to favor action. But, of course, action is quite difficult uh, and also is going to, you know, result in us facing, oh, what we believe and actually standing for it. So I, I definitely think, and then I'll give it back to you, politically, we think way too much in terms of ending action. I mean, Politically, we think too much in terms of ending acting, ending acts, as opposed to enabling action. And it would seem that you can make mm -hmm. a big difference if you were to enable action as opposed to just try to stop acting. Now, it's quite mm -hmm. funny to make distinctions using such a similar term, but hopefully it makes sense. So the difference between ending acting mm -hmm. and enabling action, I think, could yeah. perhaps be helpful. Yeah. Um, one thing I was going to make a point of is that tying, tying this back into theology, with these with these two terms i think it's interesting how um you always hear these types of doomsday preachers throughout history have always been like jesus will come back on september 22nd there was there was a big one in the 80s there was a big one in the 90s 10 years or so it seems we have a big doomsday prediction where the rapture is gonna happen it's gonna happen jesus is gonna come back i think if you ask the people that believe this okay how about this uh, Jesus is going to come back. And that means that like, there will be no more monetary worries for you. Right. So give me all your money. So give, all, give me exactly. all your money. Um, the, yeah, the, the day before, but let's say it happens on September 22nd. How about this? Give me all your money. Well, wait, wait, why, why would you not give me all your money? Jesus is going to come back. There will be no more worries. You will never need this money again. Well, I don't think they would do it. I don't think they would really give it to you. Even that, even that is their belief in a religion that would still not overcome the gap between acting and an action the action would be okay i'll give you the money i'll give you the money and 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 we'll see what happens right i believe it so much right but the inauthenticity or the acting is oh um oh i would i, I would totally give you the money right i i would I, I mean i would totally take the money i would totally take the money if, if you were to offer me money right and then i go okay uh well boom <laughs> all of a sudden no more. The rapture doesn't seem to be happening anymore. So I think it's definitely interesting how you can tie that into conspiracy. You can tie that into political political questions. You can tie that into into theology. I mean, yeah, it's a very it's. I, I like that distinction from Blondell a lot. Yeah. Well, and you see, I think it, I like the distinction as well because often we say, "Oh, people," you know, we go, um, "People believe what they do, not what they believe." And I think the average person actually believes that. They'll say that. It's like, well, it's not what people say, it's what they do. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. 
there's a difference between the doing of acting mm-hmm. and the doing of action. And you see, if you have mm-hmm. a phrase like people believe what they do, not what they say, that can itself be in service of ideology and conspiracy. Yes. If doing is not defined as action, and action would be that mm-hmm. of which confronts it. Well, it would be basically that of which um, are is stakes in according to the metaphysical background or the beliefs, right? Because what are you doing? You're saying you believe the rapture is mm-hmm. happening on September 22nd. So on mm-hmm. September 21st, give me all your money. That mm-hmm. is action because it makes sense if the rapture is happening just like the person said on the 22nd and there are real stakes. Yeah. You know, the person's going to lose all Mm -hmm. their money now, right? So there are stakes. And that, I think, is what we need to think. Because you're not not basically confronting the person where you say, that's really dumb to say that the rapture is going to happen on September 22nd. So we're going to put you in jail to make sure you don't tell other people that the rapture is going to... That's an example of ending acting. You're stopping the acting Mm -hmm. or the acts. Well, that's not effective. You go, great. What you do is you're operating according to their worldview. You're saying, okay, assuming Mm -hmm. that the rapture will happen on the 22nd, just like you said, you should carry out action relative to your beliefs. And I'm going to help you by being willing to take your money on September Give me all your money. (laughs) Yeah, I'm here to help you. I am a a Mm -hmm. giver. I I am who you need in your life right now. And Mm -hmm. you see that what is very, very concerning is that Politically today, we don't see any enabling of action. We see ending of acts, ending of acting. And then the question would be, mm-hmm. is there something about power that kind of knows that and doesn't want us to engage in action? You know, if it can play this game of like ending acts, does that benefit the state somehow? And it, maybe it does, because if everyone's fragmenting off into conspiracies or believing the rapture is going to happen on, you know, September 22nd, if you think the rapture is going to happen September yeah. 22nd, you're probably not going to try to overturn the state or change health care or try to fix, uh, you know, unemployment or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you're all trying to figure out QAnon, mm-hmm. you're probably not, you know, checking the power that be because you because there's something about the deep state, like the whole idea of the deep state. Mm-hmm. That then makes the visible state irrelevant. You stop worrying about the visible state because you're only it's, concerned. It's sort about- of like a yeah. It's sort of like a. I was gonna say it's like, it's like a nominal distinction. The, the the deep state is kind of like this like this nomina that, that's like behind the state, and then we can't. It's like a, the state's just a representation of it. We can't really get to this deep state, right? But we know it's there because it because it's it, it's creating the um the the representations of the state, how the state looks. It's very Kantian, actually. I'm thinking yes. about this more. It's a very Kantian idea, the deep state. It's it's this nominal distinction where, yeah, the, the, the state that we see that acts and that we say, oh, that's the U.S. government. That's just this representation that is created by 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 the noumena, by the by the noumena. This is created, but it's not really it, right? But what is the deep state can't really be said. It's like this unspeakable. It's this ineffable. It's just kind of this this thing we have to presume is there. But if someone said, okay. All right, you believe in the deep state. Give me three characteristics of the deep state. I think the person would have a very difficult time because kind of like the noumena, you don't really know what it is. And that's the whole point. It's just the thing that's underlying the representations, right? That's kind of how I see it. They'll probably be like, well, it's like Washington, D.C., but underground. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So they have an underground (laughs) Congress. (laughs) It's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's good. That's good. Okay. No, it's really yeah. funny because it's like well, the problem with it too is you say, "Oh, I'm against the deep state," so you're not paying attention to what I guess the shadow state is doing, and then the shadow state can do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. So there's this kind of irony where if you're only concerned about the date, maybe the shallow state or the visible state, we'll say the visible <laughs> state, maybe the visible yeah. state wants people to believe in a deep state because then they're not really concerned about the visible state because they're only looking for the deep state that's not there. So maybe, you know, Mm -hmm. if we want to be conspiratorial, uh, maybe there's an incentive for the visual state to engage in ending acting as opposed to enabling Mm -hmm. action, because where there's acting, the deep state and all of this thinking stays alive, which then makes the visual state, you know, they're less challenged, they're not checked and balanced. So, oh, this is great. We're getting into a conspiracy Mm -hmm. on a talk about the dangers of conspiracy. Oh, it's so great. (laughs) See, this is what I mean. We aren't the beautiful souls. Conspiracy isn't out there. 
it's it, it, it it's always already with us. There's always this inclination towards it. Kind of like you were talking about the schizophrenic. Maybe maybe the schizophrenic trajectory of modern capitalism or capitalism in 2023 leads us into being more prone to conspiracy as we just jumped into one right now. And now we're like building this up. We're now building up the deception. We're building up the deception that, oh, there's, there's, the state is deceiving us because really it wants us to know that there's, that there's a deep state because then it, it won't, it won't look at, then we won't have to confront the big other. Yeah. 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 Well, and it goes to show yeah. you, it goes to show you how thought naturally can structure a conspiracy because you, mm -hmm. we talk long enough. Give us mm -hmm. enough time. We'll arrive somewhere in there with something that sounds plausible, right? So then the question becomes, yeah. what is the nature of thought to be so capable of doing this, right? Like, what is thought? Like, we, mm -hmm. we so much think we're like, oh, if you, the more you think, the more you're going to get at truth. Well, maybe the more you think, the more you'll come up with yeah. like scenarios that you can string together. And yet what's so interesting. And I, this is. Okay, sorry, you can finish. I'll, I'll say it. No, no, no. I was just going what's so interesting is that mm -hmm. what if there is a conspiracy where the visual state wants there to be the D state? Like thought <laughs> arrives at something that might be true. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? How do you respond mm -hmm. to the might, the great might? Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. So I think this kind of gives a good example. Um, this this kind of what you, what you said is that maybe the further we think actually brings us into these conspiracies. And I think this is something that if you were talking to an analytic philosopher, they would, they, they would, they would shut down. They would shut down. They'd go, no, the more you think it's to the truth, the more you think, the more you specify the truth. But I think that as we've come to see, we've talked so much, we've walked into a conspiracy thinking about how crazy conspiracies, oh, not crazy, but how and analyzing the structure of conspiracies, we've walked into a conspiracy ourselves. And I think that if you were telling an analytic philosopher this, they would they would completely disagree. They would go, no, no, no. To think, we would get out of conspiracies. The way to get out of conspiracy is just to think, just to think about how crazy it is and how preposterous it is. And once you just tell a conspiratorial subject to think more, right, they'll just realize that they're just creating these scenarios in their head. But what if, like you said, it's not that they're thinking that they need to think more, but in a sense is that they need to think less they, they need to engage yes. in less her hermeneutic suspicion that there is meaning to every single phenomena right yeah oh 100 percent. well it goes to show you it's almost like the distinction <laughs> of thinking as act versus thinking as action and in mm -hmm. that it'd be like in thinking as act there's no stakes right like no one has gone like, OK, mm -hmm. Dan, well, if you think that here's a thousand, I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars if you can give me one shred of evidence that that is actually occurring or go up and visit D.C. or something. Mm -hmm. Then you're like, oh, no, we're just we're just talking. We're just talking, yeah, yeah. you know, but if it's like it's almost like to me, it does go. And perhaps here we start seeing a movement from understanding to reason or avoiding. It's like thinking is naturally one sided in terms of acting. It doesn't want to move to action because mm -hmm. then there's like stakes involved. Right. And you might be shown as wrong. Mm -hmm. So what we see is the analytical philosopher may not appreciate that there's a difference between thinking as act and thinking as action, which means mm -hmm. that thinking to its own devices, if it's just thinking relating to thinking. Well, just create systems of coherence. They don't correspond, yeah. but they cohere. You know, I, I like to talk about the difference between coherence and correspondence. And we've made yeah. the mistake of thinking that the more you think and the more coherent your model, the higher the likelihood it corresponds when there exactly. is no necessary relation between coherence and correspondence. Uh, mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the big, uh oh, uh, you know, there might be. The thing you co you need coherence to have a coherent worldview and not lose your mind. But here's mm -hmm. the funny thing: precisely the need for the coherence to keep you from being overwhelmed with anxiety that causes you to lose your mind is precisely what can lead you into something that people would say, "Wow, he's lost his mind because he's gone into QAnon." <laughs> so the very yeah. mechanism of thinking coherence that we need not to be crazy is why we are at risk of being crazy per se. Yeah. We don't think of rationality, if you will, as having that dual function of being mm -hmm. the thing we need to have a coherent sense of self and et cetera, so forth. And that very coherence being why we're at risk. That's what we've not thought. 
because that sucks. <laughs> that that mm -hmm. that sucks. That that changes everything all of a sudden. But then I'll give it back to you. Look, if you look through history, why are there all these cliches about the genius being the crazy person? I mentioned John mm -hmm. Nash. Well, we do this thing where we say madness is the opposite of rationality. Ladies and gentlemen, if madness corresponds with rationality, then madness is probably a product of rationality, not yes, its opposite. Yes. And But once you confront that, everything changes. The, the mm -hmm. whole way you do education, the whole way you think, the whole idea of what the, the human is, the rational animal. Oh, crap. We're the rational yeah. animal. That would mean we're the conspiratorial animal as well, yeah. right? So we have not thought of coherence as a necessary evil. I almost want to say evil might be strong, but we haven't thought of rationality as what provides us with coherence that is a necessary risk. And because mm -hmm. we haven't, I guess you'd put it this way, because we have not thought of it as a necessary risk, we have, er we have as a result not engaged in risk managing strategies, such mm -hmm. as making sure that we're always engaging in action as opposed to mm -hmm. acting by making sure our thought always has stakes in the game. And I think we've tried mm -hmm. to do that with grading. Like, oh, you want to write a paper, you could get a grade. So there's stakes for your ideas. But the problem is that's not real mm -hmm. stakes because it's like the professor's opinion. Yeah. And then it all just gets captured by the system. No, we're talking like stakes. And those stakes have to yeah. be in terms of the person's worldview. But we haven't done that because we don't understand that thinking is a necessary risk in the creation mm -hmm. of the very coherence we need to be together that can also cause us into a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is interesting because this kind of ties into some of your discussion about the AB distinction that we should choose. Mm. We should choose AB, right? We should not just accept A because if we if we look at at what we're calling a rational animal, right? Instead of choosing this, the, 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 this we're remaining in this system of coherence, creating system of coherences. Why don't we embrace the madness in a sense? Why don't we embrace the madness? Embrace that that that, that if if geniusness tends towards madness, well, let's embrace madness. Let's choose B, right? Exactly. Let's choose B. You know, yeah, yeah. I I was just trying tying into that. And another thing too is that in your discussion about the professor, like like how the grades could depend on the professor's opinions. I, this brings me back to the notion of ambiguity. What if you would enter a college class and the professor said, this is how I'm grading your assignment. And they named like 10 exact ways of which your assignment will be graded. So then when you submit an assignment, you don't go, okay, well, I know it's, I know what's going to happen, right? This is like the 58 speed limit past, past the 58. I'm going to get pulled over. Just like if I don't follow one through 10, my my grade's not going to be as good. It's not going to be up to the professor's ambiguity. It's not going to be up to, did the professor like the way that I phrased this? Or, or did the professor, you know, not like that I didn't indent a paragraph or something? <laughs> like, something like that, right? You have these 10 characteristics. And I think that that just, just as how, if, the, if we have this for the state, this also gives more power to the student. The student knows, if I follow these 10 characteristics, I will get 100. It is destined, right? I will get 100. It is true. But if I don't follow these 10 characteristics... I won't get a hundred, but uh, eliminating this gap or at least lessening this gap gives me more power as a student because I'm not beholden to the professor's ambiguity, to the professor's opinions anymore. Yeah. Oh, I think also it makes me think of the action um, acting distinction, because mm -hmm. if you knew, like if you had a society that understood that distinction and you said, well, I know that if I do something of action, then mm -hmm. I will be given legitimacy by others. Because right now people say, oh, that's just your beliefs. That's just your belief. That's just your belief. Well, then that right there leads to conspiracies because people, well, it's my mm -hmm. opinion. It's my beliefs, right? But if, yeah. if, but if there was literally a very clear way to kind of make a distinction between a worldview that actually has some force to it as opposed to a worldview mm -hmm. that was just coherent relating to itself, and that was, okay, if you want me to take you more seriously, you must carry out action – ergo do something with stakes, which I think alludes to Karl Popper's falsification. But the problem is with falsification, I could say, well, it's falsifiable that the government is taking over. It's just that I can't get into the Pentagon to find out. So yeah, falsification yeah. doesn't necessarily help with this, although it's better than nothing, because you can just say the terms of the experiment of falsification are out of reach. And mm -hmm. you would say, technically, it is falsifiable. I just am denied power, the ability to falsify it. And then the power makes the only truth falsifiable. So when I can't falsify it, that, that kind of proves them, right? And so that's not going to work. Is another, yeah. 
this is another Kantian point where Kant's like, well, if I could know the soul, that would be great, but I can't because because the because the the it's in the nomina. Or if I could know that there's a self, then I would, but it's in the nomina. There's this like this again the gap. There's a gap between me knowing that there's a soul and me not knowing there's a soul, and so I'm stuck in this oscillation between being like, well, yeah, I mean, maybe if I could know there's a soul, I would go and do it. Right. I would go into the Pentagon. I would realize that the government is doing this conspiracy or that conspiracy, but I can't. And because I can't, because there's a but, but and this doesn't this doesn't falsify it. Right. Kant saying that, well, the soul could exist, but I don't know. Like it's it's beyond my perception. And yeah. Yeah. So falsification, you know, Karl Popper himself did not mean to yeah. say that the only true things are falsifiable. He was trying to make a distinction between science and pseudoscience. But that right yes. there goes to show you falsification is not enough. You're not going to pull yes. people out of conspiracies. They're going to just simply say, okay, my conspiracy is not science. That doesn't mean it's false. And so it's not yeah. going to do it. You know, for me, stakes is where you start getting something, where you start saying, okay, <laughs> if you believe that, say, Trump is, you know, he's the one who should be president, uh, he's the mm -hmm. one who Q wants to be president, storm, et cetera, so forth, then you ought to donate 50% of your money to him, or you ought to go be... Why don't you join his campaign? Why don't you yeah. join like your energy and donation? You start thinking, and they may do that, and that might not be strong enough as a, mm -hmm. as a skin in the game example, but at least now you're thinking in terms of skin in the game, if you understand mm -hmm. everything we're saying. Like at least now mm -hmm. you're saying, okay. And then if you yourself start going, okay, what do I do for myself to have skin in the game? What am I actually doing as opposed to just saying it changed? Once you take seriously this idea that basically the only way to close the gap is stakes, uh, some sort mm -hmm. of risk, um, <clears throat> which then speaks to the epistemological necessity of risk. Well, then that changes how you think. And one of the things I was going to say, too, earlier, oh, I also wanted to um, note, and I never did, that another axiom of the conspiracy is that the state is competent, that they know what they're doing and they're all powerful. Yes. Yeah, when you know, they that, complete. You yeah. know, when that doesn't follow at all, like I always like the movie Brazil, where, you know, there's like the government is completely incompetent and there's a totalitarianism because they get lost in the paperwork. That's probably <laughs> closer to the truth. Uh, you know, something more kind of dark comedy like that. So, mm -hmm. and, and also there probably is a kind of comfort, and I've heard other people say that there's a comfort in believing that there's someone out there who knows what's going on and they're in control. Uh, because, you know, that means it's theoretically possible to be in control. And, oh, that's good. Ah, uh, good. I can sleep at night knowing that everything's a nightmare because I know it's a nightmare. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's good. I'm not missing out on anything when my life sucks because it's all a nightmare yeah. or something. It all has ideological functions. But the point I was going to say is that there's a M Mikhail Planier in his book, Personal Knowledge, which is a really good book. And you know it's a really good book because nobody read it, uh, is where <laughs> he warns that we have got to move away from believing that the only possible thought is that which you can have certainty about. Yes. Because he basically says certainty is impossible. Mm -hmm. And you see the conspiracies use this all the time because they say, well, you don't know that QAnon is false. Mm -hmm. And you turn around and you say, but you don't know it's true. Well, that's not, you're done. It's over. Everyone's yeah. lost in their tribe, right? So what, what Planier says is we need to have a defense of actually understanding it is precisely, it is precisely because an idea can be false that it has possibility of contact with reality. One of these wonderful lines mm. in Leslie Newbegin plays. It's actually very Hegelian. And the irony is a lot of these modern counter-enlightenment thinkers are really Hegelian and hate Hegel. It's one of the great, yep. you know, it's one of these great Harold Bloom ironies of uh, anxiety Common, of influence. Or, or, or as Foucault said, Foucault has a comment. I, I, I don't know if I quoted this. It, it, at one point in my um, draft, I, I had this, but it, Foucault basically says that the the entire 20th century of anti-Hegelianism may just all be a trick by the old man himself. And there he is standing at the end, waiting for us and laughing, right? Oh, it, it, all these anti-Hegelians, and this is a Zizek point that Zizek makes all the time, that the most, Lacan at his most anti-Hegel, where he's like, Hegel's wrong here, this is what I say, is Lacan at his most Hegel. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Oh, Lacan, I, when he thinks he's, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I didn't mean to interrupt. I mean, I think his, uh, when Zizek's like, Kierkegaard, yeah. Kierkegaard, I'm sorry, man. You know, yeah. and, uh, bodies without organs, you know, organs without bodies, where he talks about Kierkegaard. I think it's very good. And Harold, look, it is definitely the case when you go through the history of literature that all of these poets, Harold Bloom's right on this. You look at all these poets who says, I'm not like that guy. 
And that's precisely who they're most like, you know, and like, you know, someone even made an example of Harold Bloom, who really, you know, Harold Bloom really didn't like T.S. Eliot. And there was that one literary scholar over at maybe Stanford who made a really convincing case that Harold Bloom's really similar to freaking T.S. Eliot. It's great. To to apply a psychoanalysis to Lacan, when Lacan says, here, I am not doing Hegel. This is kind of like Freud's notion of the dream when the man walked into his office and goes, and goes, the woman in my dream, I don't know who not she my was, mother. but she was not my mother. She was not my, not mother. my mother, right? <laughs> exactly. And and this is Lacan. I don't know what I'm, I don't know who I got this from, but it's not Hegel. This is not Hegel, right? And I think that that's, and just as Freud shows, this shows that probably it was the mother in the dream. Probably it is Lacan doing Hegel when he's saying, I'm not doing Hegel. So, yeah. Oh, well, we, <laughs> um, we don't make a point to say something is unlike us unless it's like us enough for us to need to say it's not like exactly. us, right? I, uh, it, you know, the, the mm -hmm. claim that it's not like that, well, why do you need to say that unless there's enough similarity to make it seem like that needs to be said, right? Yes, so, yes. you know, there's all the For time instance, um, a, a good example of this is a very Freudian example, I feel like. But if someone says something and, and, and let's say you're talking to someone and you say something, and and they kind of look at you weird and then you realize they could have interpreted that in like a sexual way you go it's not like that it is like that you said it wasn't like that because you not not only <clears throat> did you look, look at their bodily movements and saw their like eyes kind of look weird or their mouth kind of tense or whatever but also your unconscious that was an unconscious response where you were probably unconsciously desired to kind of mean it in a sexual overtone as well but to try and censor yourself, you say, well, it's not like that. And you're not just speaking to the person. You're speaking to yourself. You're speaking to your own unconscious. You're trying to tell your unconscious that, no, you're wrong when it's actually not like that. It's actually not like that sexual overtone. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a great example. And I think that also highlights and then I, um, it also highlights why the name of the game is not simply to remove gaps in all situations, mm -hmm. because right there, actually, it would have been better not to have said it's not like that and yes, left open the ambiguity, which then in that very um, kind of dispersion of the notion would have had it kind of weaken away. But precisely when you say it's not like that, that's when you confirm the gap, mm -hmm. really. <laughs> Funny enough yeah. that, you Good know, point. yeah. So there's an interesting enough, like, this is why, well, this also, I think, shows why, dare I say, analytical rationality alone is not enough, because you see how it's kind of situational, right? Like, it's very, and you have to then have the discernment to say, what is the rational action? In the situation of the government, maintaining the gap is bad, and you need, like, risk to close it, because otherwise mm -hmm. you get a conspiracy. But often in, like, personal relationships, you know, people will be like, oh, I wear my heart on my shoulder. I, I tell people everything. I don't hold anything back. Well, that can actually be problematic also mm. uh, because there are ways in which that kind of constant explicitness can be actually concealing things in disguise or make things awkward that don't need to be awkward. Or also it may destroy any meaningful difference between a friend and associate. Like if you tell anyone you meet the same things you tell your friends, then your friends are actually offended. It's like, well, what, what the frick, man? I'm no different yeah. than anyone. So it's interesting to think that the human being has to get – the human has to be a being who is a master of the art of gaps, that there mm. are places where gaps are good and there are other places where they're bad. And it's almost like the human being tends to get it always exactly wrong. Like we close the gap where we need to keep it open and mm -hmm. we open it where we need to close it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because the gaps we need to keep open are the real. That's what yes. it is. It's almost like a Heideggerian clearing where the real comes out where like in that example of the, the exchange where you, you think you said something sexual, the real is that your friend might be upset at you and you mm -hmm. leave yourself exposed to that possibility and not getting rid of it. Whereas if you go, but it's not like that, you're trying to close the gap and therefore mm -hmm. not face the risk of the real, which is precisely what screws everything up. It's like if you don't, because what you're doing is you're saying, I don't want to risk the real of mm -hmm. you being upset with me. So I'm going to make you realize that I didn't mean that. Ah, which to is lose. Yeah, yes, so yes. which is precisely yes. where you lose it, right? Because mm -hmm. there is something about the Deleuzian metaphysics that makes no space for space. Mm 
Like there's yes. always an expression and a making explicit precisely the imperceptibility. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to express that which makes me imp imperceptible. I'm always going to manifest that I want everyone to kind of know it so mm -hmm. that it can be expressed. Because if I don't express it, the imperceptible metaphysics are not there, which then precisely does not allow there to be the space of you. If you're truly imperceptible, just be imperceptible, right? Exactly. You know, just be it. Uh, and there is something, again, there absolutely is something to be said about, I think when Deleuze talks about imperceptibility helping us avoid the capture of the control society, yeah. he's exactly right about that. There's a lot of wisdom in that thinking. The yes. question is, how do we have imperceptibility from the real as opposed to imperceptibility in realization? And the mm -hmm. it's almost like in that example, the imperceptibility is the gap of the possible misunderstanding. Like yes. I can't prove, you know, there's a possibility of being misunderstanding in that possibility i'm now like a schrodinger's cat mm -hmm. i could have i could have been sexual and i may have not been sexual and so yeah. i'm imperceptible in the same way that the schrodinger's box is not open which would make it be one so you mm -hmm. perceive the cat and now it's both in that am in that schrodinger state you actually are imperceptible because you cannot be rendered into a singular interpretation but mm -hmm. that then requires you to kind of own the possible uh anger that your friend has or hurt which then creates a space that the relationship can flourish in because because if you don't need to say it's not like that, that means there's trust. I trust you to know I wouldn't have mean it that way. Mm -hmm. I trust you to like know that I'm not the kind of being who would do that. So here's the funny thing almost there. Precisely because you leave that gap imperceptible mm -hmm. like the Schrodinger's cat, there's knowledge. There's real knowing. You know mm -hmm. that I'm you're, you're allowing the possibility of a real relationship. Precisely because mm -hmm. there is the possibility of a misunderstanding that you trust the person mm -hmm. would not do. And what's interesting is that would be Mikhail Planier, because you can only have real knowledge where there is the possibility of misunderstanding that you allow and keep open so that you can have the reality of trust and true friendship there. Which if you mm -hmm. close to make sure that your friend realizes that you didn't mean it that way is precisely an insult to the friendship. Don't you trust them? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so there's this interesting, like, it's not about removing gaps, but knowing where to place them. And very often mm. we place the gap in our relationship to the state so we can get an empowerment or the conspiracy or all the mechanisms of GAs on you described. But we're not going to leave it between us and people because mm. that would be a location of the gap that results in a clearing that has the real come forth. But that's what's required for there to be a real relationship in terms of trust. So it's interesting to think of the name of the game being the location of the gap, not the removal of the gap. Mm -hmm. and, and and this this kind of ties into what Lacan calls the thing uh, in, his, in his seminar on ethics, where the thing is this <clears throat> this like empty space in the system of signification. It's the, the thing is a paradox because it because it can once yeah. be this ultimate proximity to the thing, or it's an ultimate absence from the thing. And what this thing is depends on who you are, right? But this thing, is it, you either feel the anxiety of the thing through the ultimate proximity of it or the ultimate absence. And I, I think that when we when we speak of gaps, we want to maintain a proximity, but not an ultimate proximity. We also don't want to maintain an ultimate absence, but we do want to maintain an absence, right? This is kind of what a gap is, I feel like. Because a gap, if it's too big, right? If it's too big, then we're not really talking about anything, I feel like if a gap is all encompassing. But when we speak of a gap, we always speak of it in context, for instance, of that example um, of uh, that I made of, of the person who should leave open the, the gap to um, to like, to like because, because their friend trusts them and, and their friend knows that they're not going to speak sexually or whatever. They leave open that gap because there's this proximity of the gap to their, to their friend's conversation. But there's also an absence of that gap because there can't... But, there, there's an absence of the gap, but the gap can't be an ultimate absence because if it's an ultimate absence, it's it's not really there in a sense. And so you you kind of have to you kind of have to work. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. Um, you kind of have to work with with the recognition that the gap can both be proximate and absent at the same time, or what what the gap is gapping or repelling from is both proximate and absent at the same time. I'm trying to figure out how to word it. I'm having trouble. No, but, it's very yes. interesting. So a few things come to mind. Uh -huh. 
So, you know, you mentioned in your book is really good where for Hegel, things are kind of a bizzle, like the yes. tree, you made the tree example, right? Yes. So there's a problem where there's a problem in a sense of thinking of things. Like things are not things in the way, like as in points. They're like, um, they're more like, uh, well, this is what I was going to say. I've been thinking of it lately, kind of referencing Le Leibniz. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Anthony Morley, did a tremendous book on Leibniz on mm -hmm. analysis of situation. And basically what Leibniz argues is that there are no, there's not really, um, he wants to say that all thinking has to be geometrical because if it's not geometrical, it's not real. So he's kind of critiquing Cartesian um, calculus, really. And the example that he wants to make is he says, um, imagine there are two identical temples, okay? Mm -hmm. And by an identical temple, he means that if you saw one, you would think it was the other. This okay? is the, this is the uh, I think it's called the identity of indiscernibles. Yes, very good. That's good. So it's like the temples, like something yeah. is similar if you cannot discern it as not the other thing when in yeah. isolation from the other thing, mm -hmm. right? So he makes a really interesting point. He says the only way to confirm the two things are not the same thing is, preci is precisely to bring them in a relation. And that if they're mm -hmm. not in relation, you can't actually understand there's two of them, only one of them, right? So then what he's actually saying is you can't quantify things unless you bring them in a quality, like terms of a quality. Mm -hmm. And that and and you see, the point is really clear when you have identical entities, but he would say that actually applies to everything. Everything is understood as itself in relation to other things. And here's the other funny point. When you count, the moment you count something, you say, oh, there's one, two, three, four. Why do you count the apples? Because they share mm -hmm. qualities. You mm -hmm. don't quantify things together that don't share quality. So he's like, that almost means quality is deeper than quantity. Or mm -hmm. quantity can't make sense unless you have quali qualification to even begin quantification. So what he wants to say, and he's not saying quality is more real than quantity. What he's saying is it's always a situation. All thinking occurs in a situation of relations. Where, and so there's no such thing as a point, like a number. Like you never get the number one outside of a reference to a quality. And so what he's really concerned about is mathematics that is non-geometrical. And mm. honestly, that's like thinking that doesn't have to take risk, right? It's yes. mathematics, it's coherence without correspondence. And um, that one of the papers in the map is indestructible is how the formulation of mathematics is very much like a conspiracy. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it actually mathematics, you say, oh my gosh, it has to be, you say it has to be discovered. It has to be discovered, not created because look, all the pieces add up. It's all perfect. Well, that that's a conspiracy, right? Like it has to be discovered because there's no way all these pieces could go together unless they refer to, they're too accurate. And so the problem is like, people don't realize how much of mathematics is discarded, right? Like there's infinitely mm -hmm. more mathematics that has never corresponded with anything than there is mathematics that does correspond. You just don't get taught the mathematics that doesn't correspond with anything. When Badu, because Badu does a lot of stuff with set theory and surreal numbers and surreal numbers, they, they don't correspond with anything. They are purely theoretical. It's just the point that like in between every, every real number or, or no, or you can say like whole number, there is a numerical multiplicity underlying this that extends towards infinity. And that in this numerical multiplicity, each, each number in that decimal point itself is followed by a numerical mul multiplicity that extends towards infinity. Right. right. And you've, you've, and then it continues on and on and on. So you've, you've created this whole system of surreal numbers, but what does this mean? There's nothing in our world which acts this way. There's nothing in our world, which there, there is no usage. And Badu even admits that. I mean, he tries to tie it into like voting and says that like voting, voting is voting in a liberal democratic society is faulty because there's these instances of surreal numbers and we'll never be able to truly count how many votes there are because there's these underlying multiplicities or whatever. But it, I think Badu kind of recognizes that this doesn't really mean much. There is no like, correspondence this is a perfectly coherent system but it doesn't correspond with anything in reality it's just all in the person's head that made it and the person that made it is a is a uh, mathematical realist as well so he believes that this does exist in reality he believes that floating somewhere in a in, in a world of forms that there there are these infinite multiplicity of, of surreal numbers and it's like i don't know i'm i'm split on platonic realism i'm, I'm unsure if i think that mathematical objects exist but I don't think that 
surreal numbers would exist. If there are mathematical objects that exist, they're probably just never. It, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm still looking at the mathematical. Oh, no, I understand. Them, but, yeah. and a lot of people don't realize that Kurt Gödel's incompleteness mm -hmm. theorem for him confirmed mathematical Platonism or the yes. mathematical realism because he's like, well, look, if everything's incomplete and yet still works. That would mean they can't provide their own grounding. There has to be some grounding transcendent of him. So he's he's a lot mm -hmm. more interesting in his views. Um, but on the idea, like, I think I think we have to, part of the conversation today, and I'll just note this uh, quickly, is that we have to go back and think about what does Plato mean by forms? And yes. because a lot of, like, the Platonic... The perceptibles. Realm, yeah, perceptibles. the imperceptibles in different yeah. things. And, you know, what's so interesting is that he refers to forms like the orbits of planets in the end of book seven, the trajectory according to which things unfold. He does not refer to forms as detached, perfect versions of entities. That seems to be Platonism. Whereas mm -hmm. what's very interesting in book seven, he almost is like, don't look at the planet, don't look at the, the spheres because they're too perfect. If you look at mm -hmm. them, you'll be tempted to look away from the world. He's like, forms are more like the orbits that planets follow versus the, the planets themselves. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a version of Platonism that has these kind of perfect independent forms or whatever, but it's really interesting to think of forms as transcendent of the planet. You know, the, the orbit is not located in the planet, but it's also the trajectory unfolding of the entity, right? Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. seems to be like, when I look at Wolfgang Smith and his vertical causation, when I listen to some of the Neoplatonism, they seem to be trying to find this kind of medical space where you say, Yes, mathematical objects are real because humans think them and organize their trajectory according to them. Mm -hmm. And also there's no such thing as the human subject that isn't following forms in their very formation. So we mm -hmm. have to, like, what is the function of the word? There's kind of like real meaning exists independent of other things. Yes, and mind this, mind independent object is kind of what the common term is in contemporary analytic, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that also comes from like the possibility of brain and mind. Mm -hmm. Or is it something like where we get into the weirdness of Hegel? Is it some sort of like brain slash mind where the immaterial and the material are two sides of the same coin because the material yes. is ultimately abyssal, right? Mm -hmm. Like it would be really interesting. Usually, I think a lot of the return to Neoplatonism um, um, would actually find a lot of Hegelian overlay. Uh, and then, you know, because in Hegel, you have the notion of things are not things, but they're also not nothing because mm -hmm. nothing is not what we think it is. Nothing is more like N-O in parentheses thing or Hegel's always talking about incomplete with the I-N in parentheses. Like things are incomplete in their completeness because that's what makes possible their becoming, right? Mm -hmm. So it gets very, there is where I think a lot you could go through where you start saying, yes, there are mind dependent entities, mm -hmm. um, but also mind is always bound up with a material manifestation and the material manifestation is always brought up in notion. And I think this mm -hmm. is this weird kind of, I've called it dialectical monism of Hegel, nature, notion, two sides of the I, same. I, I believe that Hegel is a monist. I, um, I'm writing a paper right now called A Contemporary Form of Absolute Idealism. It's about 35 pages. Nice. Now. And um, yeah, it's, it's currently right now what I've, what I've, what I've been barking on recently is I've come to understand that there's a syllogism that exists between the, between the, the, the ethical state or the perfect state, whatever you want to call it from philosophy of right <clears throat> spirit and the absolute. And there's a syllogism and the syllogism is structured in the same way as the concept from the science of logic, universality, particularity, singularity. And the reason why the state is universality is because Hegel says that the state is the absolute on earth. It's like the finite yes. form of the absolute. But the state cannot be the ethical state without first realizing the absolute. This moves us into the second moment, particularity or in my syllogism, spirit. Spirit, the state has to allow spirit because if you just have a state where there's no people in it and there's nobody being ruled, it's not really a state, right? So you have to allow the interjection of spirit, just as for Hegel, you have to move into nature from universality, right? You have to move into finitude from an infinity, right? And then this, this movement into spirit then gets brought up, sublated with the ethical state into the absolute, meaning that for the ethical state to really be an ethical state, to realize its place in the world, to realize its place as, as, as a state that has power and, and, and is trying to reach this point of absolute knowing the state has to be sucked up or sublated 
into recognizing its place in the absolute as striving towards the absolute. And this avoids the bad infinity where we would say that if the state is just trying to reach the absolute and it's always like beyond what the state, the state is trying to reach, we fall into bad infinity. But through this sublation of spirit and the ethical state, we've realized that the absolute is always already here and spirit is in the absolute and spirit is realizing the absolute because the absolute is not absolute without spirit's realization. I agree with everything you said, and mm -hmm. Hegel is absolutely a monist. The question yeah. is, this is what I think is tricky to get with Hegel and why it's it, it's hard for people to get the monism is because, um, so on Leibniz, because basically what I'm going to say is the, the monism of Hegel is a situation. Situation is yes. monistic. I think, I think Hegel is very similar to Leibniz, certainly. Uh, yes, uh, there's, there's a Thank in, you. In, 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 the, in, the, in the conclusion of, of the paper, I've already written the conclusion. I'm kind of just working backwards. I quote Leibniz, who has a really great has a really great quote where he says that each monad is a is a window to the whole world, which means that from one monad you can build out every other relations of monads in the world, like metaphysically or ontologically. Of course, not practically, but ontologically. The, the one monad contains the plan for the entire world. Every single monad contains its relation with the entire world. And Hegel, I think, would agree too, that from each object in the absolute, you can build out the rest of the objects in the absolute because all objects relate to each other in the absolute because that is just the absolute. It's the relation of all of all the finitude together. And, and that's mm -hmm. excellent um, because the, the problem is we read monads as points. The yep. monads are situations that are, that are isomorphic. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and the key, so what you described is every monad is a situation. Mm -hmm. And the situations are all isomorphic to all other situations uh, mm -hmm. in, their, in, their, in their deepest structure. And um, so the issue is when we read another way to look at the monad, as I understand it, is um, a way I've heard Berkson describe, which I do like and I think is correct, is that Berkson describes the universe as a hologram. And a hologram, according to Stephen Robinson, is something that any point of the hologram contains all the information for all the other points. OK, so if you have one piece of the data that contains all the data in that piece. So there's mm -hmm. something where you can never, you know, holes and parts, you never separate it. The whole contains the parts, which has this, which each part contains all the information of the whole. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is very similar to what Leibniz is getting at with the monad is like he's basically saying the universe is a hologram. And each monad has the structure of the whole, and the whole is structured according to each And I part. think Hegel thinks the same thing. Yes, he and, does. And this is why I think Hegel's a monist. Because... He is. The, the problem is we can't think monist as situation. We think monist as point. So yes. on, the, on the Leibniz example of the, of the temples, what he wants to say is all intelligibility is geometrical and because it has to be you as the observer seeing the two temples, therefore determining their relation, therefore getting their, their um, mm -hmm. intelligibility. So mm -hmm. all intelligibility all intelligibility requires a situation. And he actually basically warns if we do mathematics outside of geometry, we're going to end up in conspiracy, basically. <laughs> like self-relating coherence that has yeah, yeah. nothing to do with the real world. So he's like, okay, if all thinking is situational, then you have to have a third thing. Uh, you can't just have the two points. You also have the entity to establish the relation between the two points, right? And actually, each point, in a sense, is a bizzle of the intelligibility without all three entities. The yes. one temple, the second, and the observer to see the two. So when Hegel which is like, why, Which is why truth is at once substance as well as subject. Exactly. Because when we Hegel says the tree is a bizzle, and therefore mm -hmm. it has a nothing, the tree, there are no things, there are only situations, per se. Mm -hmm. There are no things, there are only situations. Like when you say, oh, the SIP of thesis, the Zeno paradox, all of these logical paradoxes that are driving us crazy, they drive us crazy because we're thinking in terms of things and points as opposed to situations. And when mm -hmm. Leibniz talks about monad, basically what that means is he's like, all the universe consists of infinite possible situations, basically. Mm -hmm. And yes. every possible situation can be called mm -hmm. A monad. All of those monads, regardless their accidents, some may consist of temples, others apples, some bookcases, doesn't matter. They will all mm -hmm. have the same metaphysical structure. He even uses, you know, um, it's kind of funny. I really like what Anthony does. He says, we actually need to stop talking about metaphysics. We need to talk about metageometry because all uh. thinking is geometrical. 
Mm -hmm. um, so every monad is metageometrical because that is what makes possible intelligibility. And mm -hmm. that makes possible, well, existence because all things mm -hmm. are passing over into other things. A situation is a passing over in a sense of the temple relating mm -hmm. to the temple that relates to you. So there's a passing over. That passing over means relations are ontological. So relations are deepest, not, you know, points. Yes. And that metageometrical structure is what defines every possible monad. And then the whole of everything is itself isomorphic of that structure. Yes. Mainly mm -hmm. like points and observer, <laughs> you know, point yes. substance and subject. And that is yes. absolutely what Hegel thinks. And the trick is you just have to understand that a situation, the, a situation that consists of a multiplicity of points or one in their multiplicity as a situation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so what Hegel is describing is he's saying everything is me metageometrical, of which the very movement of thought itself in having to move beyond a thing to gain intelligibility means that thought searches a situation to make mm -hmm. sense of the thing that it's focusing on. Mm -hmm. So phenomenon to make sense of any point Every phenomenon is a point that only can gain intelligibility in so much as it moves between the relations of the entire situation. And yes. that creates monads. So what we see there, to go back to what we were saying about gaps, is it seems we need to fight gaps between things. That yes. tends to be what makes conspiracies and locate gaps in situations that mm -hmm. make possible the situation. Because a One situation requires difference otherness of which mm -hmm. means the gap is the situation so you need to maintain gaps in situations to have relationships where your friend doesn't hate you the real as opposed to place gaps between things you need to bring the gap to mm -hmm. kind of destabilize things into situations that's the good gap where the bad gap reifies things because there's gaps between things or you and the big other you and the state and by bringing the gap into the situation, you then get the mm -hmm. monad, and that's what Hegel's talking about. I think this is a great point that that someone should make against Adorno. Adorno read Hegel's understanding of the thing as like, the thing is incomplete because there's a gap between its completeness and its identity. So there's this incompleteness of the thing, not, not because it's relating to everything else and like an ontological community, which is, I think, the right way to read Hegel, but because that each thing itself has this has this point of nothingness, which stops it from being what it fully is. And this is that gap in the thing you're talking about. And I think this is not how we should read Hegel. This is we should read Hegel as recognizing the ontological community of all things. Yes. This point of incompleteness in the object is not a nothingness in the object itself, but it's the input of every other object in the absolute contributing to what this object is. That's and to think that this situation, and I think calling and calling the absolute a situation is really fascinating. And I might actually add that somewhere. Um, calling the absolute a situation, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and so I think thinking the absolute as a situation is very fascinating because it's always about passing over. The absolute, as Hegel says, is never like stagnant. There's never a stagnant notion of the idea. The idea is constantly changing. Our experience of reality is constantly changing. Therefore, our relations in which objects are established and the relations in which we establish with objects are constantly changing. So what we should do is we should recognize this the, this this gap that is existing in the situation between all objects but not the gap in the objects themselves just as the gap just as we should not recognize the bad gap like between us and the state the state needs to eliminate the gap between the speed limits this and we need to eliminate the gap between uh, and yeah and that's more, that's more what I want to say. That's fine. Oh, no. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, a situation is a place of action, whereas mm -hmm. gaps between things is acting. So mm. when you create a, and, you know, certainly I think you'd, I really love Mr. Morley. And again, my understanding of Leibniz is deeply indebted to him. So I really suggest mm. his book and I okay. really suggest a really good guy. Okay. And, uh, you know, he, by really kind of bringing out how Leibniz is arguing for the situation that really then helped me make a lot more sense of the monads because I did a lot, lot of Austin Farah into the monads. Um, mm -hmm. And then bring, and then it became clear as day when you get into the quantum sections and the signs of logic that it's like screaming Leibniz. And, uh, you know, oh, in yeah. a way, and you see, the thing is, another way to look at it is understanding is in the realm of thinking things, points, whereas reason is thinking situation. And the absolute is a situation. And here's the key. If you can think of the absolute as a situation,
Then when you start talking about absolute knowing, it's a kind of situating and a kind of situation for the subject. You see the philosophy of right as moving to create a certain legal and ethical situation uh, mm -hmm. that is in terms and everything then, because then the key is if you realize the gap, because the way I guess I've been thinking about it too, because there's kind of this like, oh, um, Hegel is kind of like saying, oh, there's kind of a gap you can never cross. There's a kind of limit to being in different things. And, yeah, Zizek, yeah. and you know, I think it's one of those things where it's not false, but yeah, it I false. think Zizek, Zizek definitely. And this is when, when I wrote this book, I read more Zizek than I had read Hegel. And I've been reading a lot of Hegel recently because I wrote most of this book in like September, October sure. of last year. And I didn't really read much Hegel until about November through February. Sure. So most of my understanding of Hegel was through Zizek. And as I've read Hegel now, I've completely kind of switched my opinion. I, I think Zizek's reading of Hegel is quite one-sided um, in the sense that, and he's a good, he has a good reading of Hegel, if that's what you're looking for, a very yeah. materialist, mechanistic understanding. But I think Hegel offers far more than just that. Like, um, I define, okay, sure. Um, I have my paper pulled up. I define the absolute as... The unity of being that refers to a grouping of all mental and physical things as a self-enclosed totality that ontologically grounds the infinite differentiation of things that could be and are possible. And through the, you agree with that definition kind of? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's like this totality of situation. Yeah, so I, I think that this definition is far more accurate than what Zizek reads the absolute as, where it's like, the absolute for Zizek is the recognition that there is no absolute. It's this, it, it's, it's sort of an inversion. What, what I think is, is what Hegel's saying, what I think we should be saying is that there is this ontological ground, which, which, which doesn't, <clears throat> which doesn't define the world in like a divine mind, Christological way where the world is divinely inspired, or as some people say, um, there's a divine craftsman, but the world is affirmed by some sort of singularity. And from this singularity affirms the differentiation of nature. Uh, Hegel, in his early writings on nature, I believe 1802, very early writings, he says that nature is infinitely finite. The, so nature itself is infinite, but what it affirms is an infinite amount of finite things. And I think this is how we should think of the absolute. The absolute is infinite in the sense that anything is included in the absolute, everything, literally everything, all mental, all physical objects, both non-existent and existent is in the absolute. Well, the uh, key is we have to look at Hegel. So first off, I yeah. think Zizek has successfully convinced millions of people to return to Hegel who otherwise yes. wouldn't have returned to Hegel. That's true. And I also think his reading of Lacan with Hegel is infinitely valuable because I think he's successfully... Um, made possible the realization that Hegel is kind of, as Todd McGowan in his book talks about Freud before Freud, there's a lot of mm -hmm. psychoanalytical, and that's extremely, extremely valuable. Language, uh, look, Hegel's whole section on language and the phenomenology of spirit reads like Lacan. Yeah. You read that, and you're talking, he's talking about the I as like this, this, this at once universal statement, but also referring to, 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 to something different for every single person that uses it. And it's like, this is what Lacan would say. The eye is a shifter. The eye does not have an identity. The eye is simply this the signifier of which is put in between other signifiers, but different than all the signifiers. And it's like, this this is so Hegelian. And yeah, I think I, I, think I, I agree with that point. That well, he's... absolutely. And the key, though, is um, we have to understand how much Hegel is influenced by hermetic thinking, yes. uh, mystical Christianity. Jacob, and... Jacob Bohem. Um, Mr. Eckhart, yep, yep. Pseudo Dionysus, yep, yep, yep. and Schelling's later, and Schelling's early work on mystical Christianity as well. Absolutely. Know? And so the realization that there is no absolute is precisely the realization that we are the absolute. <laughs> and so, you know, the issue is you realize that, like what Zizek is pointing out, is there absolutely is a kind of like realization that the absolute or the infinite as a standalone entity outside of relation as a point is not the case. But that's yes. actually the realization that the absolute is a situation that we are mm -hmm. already in and that the yes. thinking of it changes its unfolding. So there's this really weird relation between nature and notion, which I know Hegel uses in different ways. But the very yes. notion of nature changes the unfolding of nature, which mm -hmm. then changes how the nature comes up with notion. 
ergo so on and so on and so on and yes. so there mm -hmm. absolutely is something to be said because like again um for me like i think definitely what leibniz is getting at is that the reason why intelligibility is always situational is because he's making an indirect apologetic claim that God is a trinity and that this is how we understand yes. the trinity and why it's not a logical contradiction. Because yes, if, yes. in fact, all intelligibility is three making one, then he's like, that's all the trinity is. It's just mm -hmm. different points in relation making one. So he's making the claim by defending situation in the monad that the trinity is not a logical contradiction. And that yes. therefore, you know, if you accept the premise that creation is in the image and likeness of God, well, that should mean creation is in the image and likeness of a trinity. Uh, and that's what so Leibniz is this like. Is a, yes. This is an interesting point. I, I, I'm i talking a lot about this paper because it's on my mind, but right. I think what Hegel does is, sorry, <clears throat> I'm good. Okay. I think what Hegel does is, is he takes the picture thinking notion that 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 man is made in the image of God, as Genesis says, and he sublates it to a logical notion that man is made in the image of the concept or the notion. I I, I use concept. I like concept more. Hey, the man is used in the in the image of the no and the concept. And what this means is that there's a there's there's a particular German word that Hegel uses that people always look over when he's talking about the concept. I'm going to find the word. But what, what the word in English means is just creative power. It means creative power. So when Hegel says that the concept is a creative power, he's giving a creationist theory of, of how we came to being. But it's unlike the logical one. But the Christological one is saying we were made in the image of God in the sense that God looks like us. Jesus looks like us. We look like him. We act like him. Hegel's saying that we are impregnated. This is also another German word he uses. We are impregnated with the creative power of the concept. So through spirit, this is why spirit has to, this is why spirit is ontologically necessary for Hegel. Because Nate, because the concept has to realize itself in the form of spirit. It, the concept's creative power doesn't just disappear once the concept reaches the point of the absolute. The concept's creative power is impregnated by spirit, and then spirit uses this creative power, and this creative power of spirit is history itself. The coming to be of history is the realization of, of spirit's creative power, which is given by the concept in the first place. And this is a very, I think it's, I think it's at once a very um, ontological notion because he's taking, he doesn't ever say this, but but I think that he takes the picture thinking form of man is made in the image of God into a logical point that man's creative power is in the image of the concept, right? That's kind of how I read it. Um, and yeah, I mean, this this is all like, like new ground. I, I haven't seen any, any of scholarship talk about this stuff. I've been working on this paper for a good two weeks now and it, it's going to be fun once it comes out i'm well, looking forward to it i um yeah. i really agree with it i really like what you're saying um <laughs> to me like you can't under so basically absolute knowing is the realization of wait a minute um like the concept is the creative power of human beings it is not yes. that it is not that the concept is trying to correspond with an absolute because that's not there what it is, is that the concept itself, or I've used Notion because for so many years I talked about Notion, is precisely participating creatively in the generation of the absolute like the monad. And, the, and then there is a kind of question mm -hmm. in Leibniz where um, if you did realize situation, um, that that would, if there was a God independent of the situation transcended, they would also be in the image and likeness of that situation. But mm -hmm. then you have to make that choice. I call that kind of the ultra-logical choice. If there's an alternative kind of being beyond that that you can choose or whatever, yeah. that off the table. The point is that often we have considered um, logic as a matter of figuring out how to make concept correspond with uh, reality i tend to say you know notion mm -hmm. i i agree i know there's a debate on notion versus um correspondent i just like the two ends notion nature you know it works for me so sure, forgive sure, me sure. on that um mm -hmm. but there's a there's like for most of history being logical meant you made notion correspond with nature hegel's mm -hmm. like well actually if you look real close at the subject and start from the groundwork and go up Sure as heck looks like notion and nature are two sides of the same coin somehow, even if they, mm -hmm. but not, here's the key, but not dualistically, monistically. Mm -hmm. This yes. is the move. Because, that, yes, because the concept, 
So the concept, and this is the way I understand the concept. The concept begins as universality, universality of self-differentiation. And if something is just a universality of self-differentiation of which there is nothing else, it has to affirm something else. So this affirming something else gives birth to finitude. Yes. And this giving birth to finitude is, 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 uh, and is taken with the... So if something has the predicate of self-differentiation and it self-differentiates, the thing into which it now is, finitude, must also have that predicate of self-differentiation because it passes it on. And through these two movements of self-differentiation, we sublate them and we return to the moment of singularity, which the moment of singularity is the moment of finitude and the recognition that finitude is ontologically, that things and things in the world are ontologically related to everything else in the world. And that's the absolute for Hegel, I think. It's the recognition that everything is ontologically related and that we play a part in understanding this ontological relation. Um, and, and I think that's, that's the ontological movement of the concept in the science of logic. And so it, it unlike the post-Kantian, like Robert Pippin or Terry, Terry Pinkard would read this, would read the concept as the movement of logic, like Kant did, the universality, particularity, individuality. I think it's an ontological movement that Hegel does, where he's giving us the beginning of being and he's showing us how, how being must always become something which which affirms something different. And that's that finitude. And then the finitude can't just exist on its own because finitude without, without anything would just become the infinite as, as we know from his notion, his uh, discussion of, of infinite, right? If you have an, if you have a infinity, that infinity has to include finitude in it because if it doesn't include finitude, it's just like this abstraction, just the, the infinite abstraction. So the finitude would then have to self negate. And then this self negation becomes the absolute. And the absolute is what we always already experience as our reality. But to realize the absolute, we engage in absolute spirit. We engage in religion and philosophy and art. And this gets us to what we would know as the ontological community of all objects in the world. I think you put that very well. I agree with all of that. Um, the problem is mm -hmm. we have to understand what's happening, I think, is people don't understand the, um, the absolute as a monad or like the monad and the monad yeah. is a situation. They're thinking about points, really, and getting to points and arriving at points. But there are no points. There's only situation. And understanding mm -hmm. when it's one one sidedness is thinking points. This is good. I think this is a good point to make against people who I think Heidegger did this, accused Hegel of onto theology, where right. there's being and then there's a being of being, right? I don't think Hegel does that. I think Hegel says that the being of being is this realm of being itself. This is just the being. There is no being of being. There isn't like a like Plotinus believed in a one of which all things, there's this one cherry on top that stands above the world of finitude. But Hegel says that no, the world of finitude is this being. When we think the world of finitude, we are always already thinking this, this as a one. And this one is the world of finitude. And that's the absolute. Oh, that's exactly uh, and, that, right. and that's kind of the situation aspect. Yeah, that's exactly right. And this is why it's also so dangerous if you overemphasize, in my opinion, the Hegelian dialectic, because although the dialectic mm. is the movement of thought, if you don't realize that leads to speculative reason about why the dialectic is the case, then what you're doing is seeing Hegel is simply moving between points when really he wants like to. Hunt. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And we're mm -hmm. actually more so what Hegel's doing. He's like. Have you ever noticed that when you think of something, if you think it through, eventually it comes to like the other side? It's weird. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. That's the key. Mm -hmm. He then says, I wonder why. The dialectic, mm -hmm. he, the phenomenology is showing that the dialectic is everywhere. That it seems yeah. to define reality. It's almost like a proof. Yeah. Like everywhere you look, there are dialectics. But that's not because he's saying, because the dialectic is like, he's not saying that everything is a point becoming another point. He's saying, mm -hmm. if everything entails passing over into otherness, underline passing over. You mm -hmm. see, you can have a problem where you say, oh, something becomes something else. Therefore, point mm -hmm. A becomes point B. Um, really, it's like it, the way I write is, is like um, A slash B. I don't yes, use the yes. equal sign because the problem with the equal sign is it suggests I don't use it as much. I have used it because language is a beast. 
Uh, but yeah. the problem with the equal sign mm -hmm. is that it suggests point A is the same as point B. Really, yes. the key for is that the dialectic unveils A goes into B, but that means there's a slash. And speculative reason is like, why is there always a slash? What is the slash? What's, what must what must the nature of reality be so that there mm -hmm. is always a slash of which has things passing over into otherness? Well, mm -hmm. now we start going, well, wait a minute. What if things are not so much points as they are situations? A and B are always mm -hmm. in a situation because there's a dash, a slash that makes A and B always be in a situation. A passes to B, P passes to A, back and forth. And then there's the third thing of the slash, right? Well, that's a monad, basically, mm -hmm. a Leibniz monad, a situation. Okay. Leibniz, you know, so for Hegel, there's a real sense in which if you don't think that, you're still in one-sidedness. Mm -hmm. So actually what ends up happening is we can use the dialectic if we overemphasize emphasize it in Hegelian thought to actually kind of reify the one-sided thinking that Hegel is trying mm -hmm. to get us out of yeah. by following the movement of the dialectic to show there's always a movement. That's mm -hmm. the key. There's always a movement. It's not merely that I becomes other. It's that other becomes I and becoming, becoming, becoming. The becoming... But mm -hmm. then the way you almost have to write the becoming or you end up in a kind of autonomous Heraclitus is the becoming with the B-E in parentheses. Being mm -hmm. itself is constituted by this motion, which is okay. weird as heck because the motion also is stable. And mm -hmm. that's what a situation is. A situation mm -hmm. consists of passing, like I'm in a room. The room is a situation. The room is always the room. It has being as a room. But that being is not isolatable as merely a being because mm -hmm. there's a passing over of the bookcase to the picture, to the door, to my intelligibility of it. Every situation mm -hmm. is stable, but only yes. in so much as it is being observed as a collection of points that are not reducible to one another, ergo lines. Ergo points are always already lines, mm -hmm. and those lines are always connected in a finite space to make something geometrical. And this you see, the, yeah, I was going to say, oh, th this is a point that that I make um, in regards to what Hegel does to Kant, where Kant psychologized the unity of apperception, right? Yes. Hegel ontolo ontologizes yes. it. That's I exactly see. Right. I read. I read the abs I read the idea as the ontological unity of apperception. Yes. That that our reality is united in the sense that this isn't just like a unity of apperception that, that's in our heads and that reality is this whole like flowing and this nominal thing that reality is always united and when we see reality it isn't because it's in our heads that that objects don't just appear and disappear like a stop motion film but that reality itself is structured in the way that objects don't just disappear and read a stop motion film and that's how i read his idea um is that is that the idea is precisely this unity of apperception that's not psychologized, it's ontologized in Hegel. That's the key. You know, you, I, mm -hmm. we have to understand that in Hegel, it's always an ontoepistemology. The epistemology yes. always has ontological consequences, and the ontology always has epistemological consequences. You can't divide them. Uh, yeah. Because, well, again, I, you know, I know Trey Atelosbaum talks a lot about communal ontology and different things and the yes. Trinity and so and this on. Is where I, this is where I kind of tie in my paper a couple of times where I mentioned how Hegel's Hegel's work is kind of close to what Orthodox Christianity talks about with, with this idea of a communitarian ontology, uh, especially when it comes to, um, I know David Bentley Hart, you know, that theologian. Yeah, yeah. 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 So David Bentley Hart has said before that, that there's that the grace of God is so great and bestowed onto finite things that it becomes very difficult to separate what is and is not God. And, the way that I read this in Hegel is that Hegel says that when spirit when when spirit realizes the absolute, there is no different. There's no ontological differentiation between spirit and the absolute. There's and and this is that point is that th this is when it kind of becomes like a Orthodox Christian Christian type thing is that the 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 grace of God take out the the, the personalized term grace, but the grace of God that is bestowed on the finite things in, in Orthodox Christianity, which makes it difficult to separate God up here from the world, which Protestantism has no problem separating God from the world, but Orthodox Christianity says it's not that simple. Um, but Hegel kind of does the same thing where he says that, again, the, the absolute, when spirit realizes the absolute, when it realizes its place as a part of this ontological community, it 
can't really separate itself from what the absolute is. There's there's no ontological differentiation anymore. And that's kind of how I read Orthodox Christianity into this a little bit. Uh, I, I think you can absolutely align um, the notion of communal ontology, uh, mm -hmm. the Trinity, all of that with Hegel, because I don't think there's any doubt that basically Hegel, Hegel in a sense is one of the few theologians of the Trinity who remembers that God is not a point, but a kind of, um, Augustine describes the Trinity as three persons, one essence. Okay. Yep. And so every yep. person of the Trinity is a point. The father. That's right. And it's passing over to the son who's passing over to the spirit. And they're always passing over. And the way C.S. Lewis in the second book of the space trilogy describes it is as a dance. Well, it's very difficult not to see a situation as in the image and likeness, per se, of a trinity, where everything mm -hmm. is passing over one another. And here's the trick. You're part of it. You know, the trinity, what a lot of theologians will say is that um, the sun came out of the trinity precisely to make space for man to be part of the trinity. Uh, kind of like mm -hmm. the creation is invited into it. Because, you know, if, God, if Jesus becomes finite... Well, then the line between finite and infinite is closed, right? Like if you take seriously that you have this kind of incarnation, hypostatic union, whatever term you want to use, well, then clearly the infinite is able to relate enough to the finite to where the finite can relate to is. And then you have the Holy Spirit, which apparently somehow makes all of finitude possibly participate in the um, in the infinite and also be invited into the Trinity, right? Because if you mm -hmm. ultimately say salvation has something to do with residing with God, being in a community with God. Yeah, really like sort of a sort of like how early Christians emphasized the, the oneness that you have to get to with God. Mr. Eckhart talked about oneness a lot. And of course, Neoplatonism in general tends to talk about oneness with the one, unity with the one. I think this is what like a good form of christianity would do is get back to this point of ontological community with god right yes. sort of how with hegel's absolute there is an ontological community with the absolute because the absolute is this ontological community itself spirit cannot separate itself from the absolute not because spirit is the absolute like um Feuerbach would say sure. where he's like oh no the absolute isn't isn't this ontological thing it's just this anthropology of history it's not that. It's not what Marx says either, that, that, that the absolute is is like the end of history, communism. The absolute is the ontological stand, status of the world. And I think that's very important to remember for Hegel. It, it's huge because basically mm -hmm. if you try to read Hegel as talking about absolute as a point, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, well, it doesn't, yep. it doesn't follow. And that's where you get these readings of, oh, we're climbing toward enlightenment and a final state or different things. But no... The final absolute knowing is the realization that you are always already participating in an ontology, uh, like a deep absolute ontology, that the very process of realizing that absolute ontology, onto epistemology, is precisely the state of helping bring it about, actually. Yes. Because in the same, and so that all makes sense if we think about, like, again, if Hegel is influenced, obviously, Master Eckhart. A lot of people argue he's interested in the Hermetica, that it wasn't merely a childhood interest in Egyptian and Greek yeah. overlap, that it was something that, well, that's all about sort of God, uh, man and God being two sides of the same point. Now, the key is with the Trinity, if you're, if someone's more of an Orthodox Christian, you simply say that God chose to be part of finite reality. Therefore, there's mm -hmm. still a kind of supremacy to God. So mm -hmm. he emptied himself at it. So you don't have to take this to panpsychism if you don't want to uh, yes. or something like that. You could do a panpsychic. Um, that's a different matter. But that gets into the, ap I call it the absolute choice, your interpretation of the structure of this absolute and et cetera and so forth. But mm -hmm. absolutely, um, what you see here is in Hegel, a model, a what he basically wants to do in some respects, he's like, if you just follow thought and how thought operates and you just pay real close attention to it, you notice that it has a situational structure, mm -hmm. which then is metaphorically best understood in something that's Trinitarian, which, by the way, everyone, if you're supposedly Christian and think God is a Trinity, why in the world are you not always already thinking in a Trinitarian structure? Because that would yes. be the only, basically, thought that isn't Trinitarian or metageometrical. Yeah, I'm going to say, be, yeah. Yeah, metageometrical is going to be <laughs> thought that leads you to hell, basically. It's going to be mm -hmm. thought that leads to self-effacement destruction or it's not going to make sense of anything mm -hmm. and that's exactly what seems to have occurred isn't it if we take this whole yeah. meaning crisis nihilism mental health yeah. like basically what has happened 
is thought has led us to a place where it's trying to be point based, mm -hmm. uh, Kantian in some respects, not meta geometrical. And so it devours itself. It has mm -hmm. to be auto cannibalistic, which means eat itself because mm -hmm. it cannot sustain its own ground because it does, because its ground is found in situation. And this, and this, one of the, I think the first section of chapter one of my book is called The Snake That Eats Itself. Yes. Because that's what conspiracy is. It's exactly. a snake that eats itself. Conspiracy can never come to its realization because the, because the non-realization that, that all the truth is on the table is conspiracy. You have yeah. to have these bits and pieces. If you realize the whole, that you are always already in the absolute, that the whole is already here, there is no hole out there to search for, the conspiracy is gone. Exactly. So, and this, and this is, there, there's a point in my book when I call conspiratorial thinking absolute unknowing. I put in parentheses un to say that conspiratorial thinking is the op, is the opposite of absolute knowing yes. because it's un absolute unknowing. Yes. It cannot think that it's always already here. It has to think of a beyond. It has to project something beyond finitude. Right. And that that's kind of what, yeah. No, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because to me, you know, to, to bring it together and to me, the conspiracy seems to be the logical end of understanding or rationality that is mm -hmm. not metageometrical because mm -hmm. like what you're doing is like, and, it, and really the conspiracy is almost like the best line of defense from realizing absolute knowing or the metageometrical because you're stuck in kind of this realm of enjoyment of geasons in a way where you never have to move to the metageometrical. And if you did that, you'd have to start thinking situation, which would force you into action, which would force mm -hmm. you into the real, which would force you into confronting your self-deception, uh, mm -hmm. your self-sabotage and transforming yeah. yourself as a subject in ways that are extremely painful. So the conspiracy is last, it's like the last line of defense. And it's, and uh -huh. really, it's basically the perfect line of defense because it's, you can't defeat it within itself. And once mm -hmm. you enter it, you'll never get to absolute knowing. You'll never get mm -hmm. to the metageometrical unless you have some means of stakes in the game, action, someone like describing the structure. And then if that shatters, well, then this is the thing. If you say, wait a minute, I ended up in a conspiracy because I was rational according to how the world taught me I was supposed to be rational. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I didn't trust the authorities. I thought for myself that that's yeah. they tell you to do that all the time. Crit critical thinking. Critical thinking critical is always thinking. a big thing. Yeah. I was a critical thinker. I looked into mm -hmm. things myself. I looked into the truth. You know, I was not afraid. People were like, I wasn't scared <laughs> of power. I looked into it mm -hmm. and I ended up in conspiracy. Wait a minute. Then that must mean how I was taught to think is not the right way to think because look mm -hmm. where it ended me up. And now we have the great negation of ordinary consciousness, the great negation yep. of thinking, which then leads you to the sublation of the metageometric Speculative knowing. Speculative mm -hmm. knowing. And that's mm -hmm. the only way, basically, to, in some respects, the only way to assure you don't end up in conspiracy is the speculative knowing, which would yes. lead to see you as participating in the absolute. And then, in many mm -hmm. respects, like the science of logic is then, okay, we've established that the concept is creative and we're participating in it. What is mm -hmm. the logical way to be rational, given that the concept mm -hmm. has this absolute creative? Well, that it's an entirely different kind of logic than what you see in analytical yes. thought. It's a kind of logic mm -hmm. that is always situational, right? It mm -hmm. is always going to be taking care of movement toward the singularity uh, because the singularity is going to be always situationally based. Uh, but that's going mm -hmm. to require action. That's going to require versus acting, confronting the mm -hmm. real. And the negation sublation of the ordinary consciousness that ends up in that conspiracy, logically, this is the problem. If we keep thinking a conspiracy is an example of irrationality or mm -hmm. being stupid, then we will not take the conspiracy as the revelation of the need to negate ordinary consciousness into the sublation of speculative knowing, which mm -hmm. then leads you to the absolute knowing, which is the condition of the metageometrical by which you can start seeing the Trinity and participating in that. And that... Yes. And, we, and if we don't do that, then you're just going to keep having this meaning crisis everyone talks about. You're going to keep having nihilism because mm -hmm. the nihilism, nihilism as such, is the logical end of logic as it currently stands. Mm. Uh, yeah, and the conspiracy yeah. is simply a product of that same movement of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that sums up everything. You've touched on everything, I think. Um, Beautiful. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's a pretty good ending. I don't know what else I can say. Um, well, this was a great I, talk. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, I was glad we got to exchange so many ideas. We got, we got to talk about Hegel in the end, which I was very happy to bounce some ideas off of my paper. Um, 
And yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I'm happy to talk some other time. Just let me know. Well, Hunter, I appreciate it. I enjoyed it so much. But everyone, conspiracy and the subject by Mr. Hunter yeah. Coates, dissatisfied philosophy. Here. Bam. Go yeah. to the website, subscribe. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversation, Mr. Coates. I look forward to that paper. I look yeah. forward. I, I think you you're a very good reader of books, and that's not common. So well done to you, <laughs> sir. So I thanks so I, much. I, you too. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Mr. Coates. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.